Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back. Don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? You tried. How do the dead come back, Mother? What's the secret? I hope you enjoy our selection of Christmas ghost stories on this cold and snowy evening. The Magic Shop by H.G. Wells I had seen the magic shop from afar several times. I had passed it once or twice, a shop window of alluring little objects. Magic balls, magic hens, wonderful cones, ventriloquist dolls, the material of the basket trick, packs of cards that looked all right, and all that sort of thing. But never had I thought of going in until one day, almost without warning, Jip hauled me by my finger right up to the window, and so conducted himself that there was nothing for it but to take him in. I had not thought the place was there, to tell the truth. A modest-sized frontage in Regent Street, between the picture shop and the place where the chicks run about just out of patent incubators. But there it was, sure enough. I had fancied it was down nearer the circus, or round the corner in Oxford Street, or even in Holborn, always over the way, and a little inaccessible it had been, with something of a mirage in its position. But here it was now quite indisputably, and the fat end of Jip's pointing finger made a noise upon the glass. If I was rich, said Jip, dabbing a finger at the disappearing egg, I'd buy myself that, and that, which was the crying baby, very human, and that, which was a mystery, and called, so a neat card asserted, buy one, and astonish your friends. Anything, said Jip, will disappear under one of those cones. I've read about it in a book. And there, Dada, is the vanishing halfpenny. only they put it this way so as we can't see how it's done. Jip, dear boy, inherits his mother's breeding and he did not propose to enter the shop or worry in any way, only you know quite unconsciously he lugged my finger doorward, and he made his interest clear. That, he said, and pointed to the magic bottle. If you had that, I said, at which promising inquiry he looked up with a sudden radiance. I could show it to Jessie, he said, thoughtful as ever of others. It's less than a hundred days to your birthday, Jibbles, I said, and laid my hand on the door handle. Jip made no answer, but his grip tightened on my finger, and so we came into the shop. It was no common shop, this. It was a magic shop, and all the prancing precedence Jip would have taken in the matter of mere toys was wanting. He left the burden of the conversation to me. It was a little, narrow shop, not very well lit, and the doorbell pinged again with a plaintive note as we closed it behind us. For a moment or so, we were alone, and could glance about us. There was a tiger in papier-mâché on the glass case that covered the low counter, a grave, kind-eyed tiger that waggled his head in a methodical manner. There were several crystal spheres, a china hand holding magic cards, a stock of magic fishbowls in various sizes, and an immodest magic hat that shamelessly displayed its springs. On the floor were magic mirrors, one to draw you out long and thin, one to swell your head and vanish your legs, and one to make you short and fat like a draught. And while we were laughing at these, the shopman, as I suppose, came in. At any rate, there he was behind the counter, a curious, sallow, dark man with one ear larger than the other and a chin like the toe cap of a boot. "'What can we have the pleasure?' he said, spreading his long magic fingers on the glass case. And so, with a start... We were aware of him. I want, I said, to buy my little boy a few simple tricks. Leger de main, he asked. Mechanical, domestic, anything amusing, said I. Hmm, said the shopman and scratched his head for a moment, as if thinking. Then, quite distinctly, he drew from his head a glass ball. Something this way, he said, and held it out. The action was unexpected. I'd seen the trick done at entertainments endless times before. It's part of the common stock of conjurers, but I had not expected it here. That's good, I said with a laugh. Isn't it? said the shopman. Jip stretched out his disengaged hand to take this object and found merely a blank palm. It's in your pocket, said the shopman. And there it was. How much will that be? I asked. 
We make no charge for glass balls, said the shop man politely. We get them, he picked one out of his elbow as he spoke, free. He produced another from the back of his neck and laid it beside its predecessor on the counter. Jip regarded his glass ball sagely, then directed a look of inquiry at the two on the counter, and finally brought his round-eyed scrutiny to the shopman, who smiled. "'You may have those too, said the shopman, "'and if you don't mind, one from my mouth. So.' Jip counselled me mutely for a moment, and then, in a profound silence, put away the four balls, resumed my reassuring finger, and nerved himself for the next event. "'We get all our smaller tricks in that way,' the shopman remarked. I laughed in the manner of one who subscribes to a jest. "'Instead of going to the wholesale shop,' I said, "'of course, it's cheaper.' "'In a way,' the shopman said, "'though we pay in the end, but not so heavily as people suppose, "'our larger tricks and our daily provisions and all the other things we want, "'we get out of that hat. "'And you know, sir, if you'll excuse my saying it, "'there isn't a wholesale shop.' Not for genuine magic, good sir. I don't know if you noticed our inscription, the genuine magic shop. He drew a business card from his cheek and handed it to me. Genuine, he said, with his finger on the word, and added, there is absolutely no deception, sir. He seemed to be carrying out the joke pretty thoroughly, I thought. He turned to Jip with a smile of remarkable affability. You, you know, are the right sort of boy. I was surprised at his knowing that because, in the interests of discipline, we keep it rather a secret, even at home. But Jip received it in unflinching silence, keeping a steadfast eye on him. It's only the right sort of boy gets through that doorway. And, as if by way of illustration, there came a rattling at the door, and a squeaking little voice could be faintly heard, No, I want to go in there, Dad, I want to go in there, no. And then, the accents of a downtrodden parent urging consolations and propitiations. It's, it's locked, Edward, he said. But it isn't, said I. It is, sir, said the shopman. Always. For that sort of child. And as he spoke, we had a glimpse of the other youngster, a little white face pallid from sweet eating and over sapid food and distorted by evil passions, a ruthless little egotist pawing at the enchanted pain. "'It's no good, sir,' said the shopman as I moved, with my natural helpfulness doorward, and presently the spoilt child was carried off, howling. "'How do you manage that?' I said, breathing a little more freely. "'Magic,' said the shopman, with a careless wave of the hand, and behold, sparks of coloured fire flew out of his fingers and vanished into the shadows of the shop. "'You were saying,' he said, addressing himself to Jip, before you came in, that you would like one of our buy one and astonish your friend's boxes. Jip, after a gallant effort, said, Yes, it's in your pocket. And leaning over the counter, he really had an extraordinarily long body. This amazing person produced the article in the customary conjurer's manner. Paper, he said, and took out a sheet of the empty hat with the springs. String, and behold, his mouth was a string box from which he drew an unending thread, which when he had tied his parcel, he bit off, and, it seemed to me, swallowed the ball of string. And then he lit a candle at the nose of one of the ventriloquist dummies, stuck one of his fingers, which had become sealing wax red, into the flame, and so sealed the parcel. Then there was the um, disappearing egg, he remarked, and produced one from within my coat breast and packed it, and also the crying baby, very human. I handed each parcel to Jip as it was ready, and he clasped them to his chest. He said very little, but his eyes were eloquent. The clutch of his arms was eloquent. He was the playground of unspeakable emotions. These, you know, were real magics. Then, with a start, I discovered something moving about in my hat, something soft and jumpy. I whipped it off, and a ruffled pigeon, no doubt a confederate, dropped out and ran on the counter and went, I fancy, into the cardboard box behind the papier-mâché tiger. Tut, tut, said the shopman, dexterously relieving me of my headdress. Careless bird. And as I live, nesting. He shook my hat and shook out into his extended hand two or three eggs, a large marble, a watch, 
about half a dozen of the inevitable glass balls, and then crumpled, crinkled paper. More and more and more, talking all the time of the way in which people neglect to brush their hats inside as well as out. Politely, of course, but with a certain personal application. All sorts of things accumulate, sir. Not you, of course, in particular. Nearly every customer. Astonishing what they carry about with them. The crumpled paper rose and billowed on the counter more and more and more, until he was nearly hidden from us, until he was altogether hidden, and still his voice went on and on. We none of us know what the fair semblance of a human being may conceal, sir. Are we all then no better than brushed exteriors, whited sepulchres? His voice stopped, exactly like when you hit a neighbour's gramophone with a well-aimed brick. The same instant silence, and the rustle of paper stopped, and everything was still. Uh, have you done with my hat? I asked, after an interval, and there was no answer. I stared at Jip, and Jip stared at me, and there were our distortions in the magic mirrors looking very rum and grave and quiet. I think we'll go now, I said. Would you tell me how much all this comes to? I say, I said on a rather louder note, I want the bill and my hat, please. It might have been a sniff from behind the paper pile. Let's look behind the counter, Jip, I said. He's making fun of us. I led Jip round the head wagging tiger. And what do you think there was behind the counter? No one at all. Only my hat on the floor and a common conjurer's lop eared white rabbit lost in meditation and looking as stupid and crumpled as only a conjurer's rabbit can do. I resumed my hat, and the rabbit lolloped a lollop or so out of my way. Dada, said Jip in a guilty whisper. What is it, Jip? said I. I do like this shop, Dada. So should I, I said to myself, if the counter wouldn't suddenly extend itself to shut one off from the door. But I didn't call Jip's attention to that. Pussy, he said with a hand out to the rabbit as it came lolloping past us. Pussy, do Jip a magic! And his eyes followed it as it squeezed through a door I had certainly not remarked a moment before. Then this door opened wider, and the man with one ear larger than the other appeared again. He was smiling still, but his eye met mine with something between amusement and defiance. You'd like to see our showroom, sir, he said with an innocent suavity. Jip tugged my finger forward. I glanced at the counter and met the shopman's eye again. I was beginning to think the magic just a little too genuine. We haven't very much time, I said, but somehow we were inside the showroom before I could finish that. All goods of the same quality, said the shopman, rubbing his flexible hands together, and that is the best. Nothing in the place that isn't genuine magic and warranted thoroughly rum. Excuse me, sir. I felt him pull at something that clung to my coat sleeve, and then I saw he held a little wriggling red demon by the tail. The little creature bit and fought and tried to get at his hand, and in a moment he tossed it carelessly behind the counter. No doubt the thing was only an image of twisted India rubber, but for that moment... And his gesture was exactly that of a man who handles some petty, biting bit of vermin. I glanced at Jip, but Jip was looking at a magic rocking horse. I was glad he hadn't seen the thing. I say, I said in an undertone and indicating Jip and the red demon with my eyes, you haven't many things like that about, have you? None of ours. Probably brought it with you, said the shopman, also in an undertone, and with a more dazzling smile than ever. Astonishing what people will carry around with them unawares. And then to Jip, do you see anything you fancy in here? There were many things that Jip fancied there. He turned to this astonishing tradesman with mingled confidence and respect. Is that a magic sword? he said. A magic toy sword. It neither bends, breaks, nor cuts fingers. It renders the bearer invincible in battle against anyone under eighteen. Half a crown to seven sixpence, according to size. These panoplies on cards are for juvenile knights errant and very useful. Shield of safety, sandals of swiftness, helmet of invisibility. Oh, Daddy, gasped Jip. I tried to find out what they cost, but the shopman didn't heed me. He had got Jip now. 
He had got him away from my finger. He had embarked upon the exposition of all his confounded stock, and nothing was going to stop him. Presently, I saw with a qualm of distrust and something very like jealousy that Jib had hold of this person's finger, as usually he has hold of mine. No doubt the fellow was interesting, I thought, and had an interestingly faked lot of stuff, really good faked stuff. Still, I wandered after them, saying very little, but keeping an eye on this prestator digital fellow. After all, Jip was enjoying it, and no doubt when the time came to go we should be able to go quite easily. It was a long, rambling place, that showroom, a gallery broken up by stands and stalls and pillars, with archways leading off to other departments, in which the queerest-looking assistants loafed and stared at one, and with perplexing mirrors and curtains. So perplexing indeed were these that I was presently unable to make out the door by which we had come. The shopman showed Jip magic trains that ran without steam or clockwork, just as you set the signals, and then some very, very valuable boxes of soldiers that all came alive directly you took off the lid and said, I myself haven't a very quick ear, and it was a tongue-twisting sound, but Jip, he, as his mother's ear, got it in no time. Bravo, said the shopman, putting the men back into the box unceremoniously and handing it to Jip. Now, said the shopman, and in a moment Jip had made them all alive again. You'll take that box? asked the shopman. We'll take that box, said I, unless you charge its full value, in which case I would need a trust magnate. Dear heart, no, and the shopman swept the little men back again, shut the lid, waved the box in the air, and there it was in brown paper tied up and with Jip's full name and address on the paper. The shopman laughed at my amazement. This is genuine magic, he said. The real thing. It's a little too genuine for my taste, I said again. After that, he fell to showing Jip tricks, odd tricks, and still odder the way they were done. He explained them, he turned them inside out, and there was the dear little chap nodding his busy bit of a head in the sagest manner. I didn't attend as well as I might. Hey, presto, said the magic shopman, and then would come the clear small, hey, presto, of the boy. But I was distracted by other things. It was being borne in upon me just how tremendously rum this place was. It was, so to speak, inundated by a sense of rumness. There was something a little rum about the fixtures even, about the ceiling, about the floor, about the casually distributed chairs. I had a queer feeling that whenever I wasn't looking at them straight, they went askew and moved about and played a noiseless puss in the corner behind my back. And the cornice had a serpentine design with masks. Masks altogether too expressive for proper plaster. Then, abruptly, my attention was caught by one of the odd-looking assistants. It was some way off, and evidently unaware of my presence. I saw a sort of three-quarter length of him over a pile of toys and through an arch. And you know, he was leaning against a pillar in an idle sort of way, doing the most horrid things with his features. The particular horrid thing he did was with his nose. He did it just as though he was idle and wanted to amuse himself. First of all, it was a short, blobby nose, and then, suddenly, he shot it out like a telescope. And then out it flew and became thinner and thinner until it was a long, red, flexible whip. Like a thing in a nightmare, it was. He flourished it about and flung it forth as a fly fisher flings his line. My instant thought was that Jip mustn't see him. I turned around, and there was Jip, quite preoccupied with the shopman and thinking no evil. They were whispering together and looking at me. Jip was standing on a little stool, and the shopman was holding a sort of big drum in his hand. Hide and seek, Dada, cried Jip. You're he. And before I could do anything to prevent it, the shopman had clapped the big drum over him. I saw what was up directly. Take that off, I cried. This instant, you'll frighten the boy. Take it off. The shopman, with the unequal ears, did so, without a word, and held the big cylinder towards me to show its emptiness. And the little stool was vacant. In that instant, my boy had utterly disappeared. You know, perhaps, that sinister something that comes like a hand out of the unseen and grips your heart about. You know it takes your common self away and leaves you tense and deliberate, neither slow nor hasty, neither angry nor afraid. So it was with me. 
I came up to this grinning shopman and kicked his stool aside. Stop this folly, I said. Where's my boy? You see, he said, still displaying the drum's interior, there is no deception. I put out my hand to grip him and he eluded me by a dexterous movement. I snatched again and he turned from me and pushed open a door to escape. Stop, I said, and he laughed, receding. I leapt after him into utter darkness. Thud. Lord bless me, I didn't see you coming, sir. I was in Regent Street, and I had collided with a decent-looking working man, and a yard away, perhaps, and looking a little perplexed with himself, was Jip. There was some sort of apology, and then Jip had turned and come to me with a bright little smile, as though for a moment he had missed me and he was carrying four parcels in his arm. He secured immediate possession of my finger. For the second, I was rather at a loss. I stared round to see the door of the magic shop, and behold, it was not there. There was no door, no shop, nothing. Only the common pilaster between the shop where they sell the pictures and the window with the chicks. I did the only thing possible in that mental tumult, I walked straight to the curbstone and held up my umbrella for a cab. Ansem, said Jip in a note of culminating exultation. I helped him in, recalled my address with an effort, and got in also. Something unusual proclaimed itself in my tailcoat pocket, and I felt and discovered a glass ball. With a petulant expression, I flung it into the street. Jip said nothing. For a space, neither of us spoke. Dada, said Jip at last, that was a proper shop. I came round with that to the problem of just how the whole thing had seemed to him. He looked completely undamaged. So far, so good. He was neither scared nor unhinged. He was simply tremendously satisfied with the afternoon's entertainment, and there in his arms were the four parcels. Confound it, what could be in them? Hmm, I said, little boys can't go to shops like that every day. He received this with his usual stoicism, and for a moment I was sorry I was his father and not his mother, and so couldn't suddenly there, quorum publico, in our hansom, kiss him. After all, I thought, the thing wasn't so very bad. But it was only when we opened the parcels that I really began to be reassured. Three of them contained boxes of soldiers, quite ordinary lead soldiers, but of so good a quality as to make Jip altogether forget that originally these parcels had been magic tricks of the only genuine sort, and the fourth contained a kitten, a little living white kitten, in excellent health and appetite and temper. I saw this unpacking with a sort of provisional relief. I hung about in the nursery for quite an unconscionable time. That happened six months ago, and now I am beginning to believe it is all right. The kitten had only the magic natural to all kittens, and the soldiers seemed as steady a company as any colonel could desire. And Jip? The intelligent parent will understand that I have to go cautiously with Jip. But I went so far as this one day, I said, How would you like your soldiers to come alive, Jip, and uh, march about by themselves? Mine do, said Jip. I just have to say a word I know before I open the lid. Then they march about alone. Oh, quite, Dada. I shouldn't like them if they didn't do that. I displayed no unbecoming surprise, and since then I have taken occasion to drop in upon him once or twice unannounced when the soldiers were about, but so far I have never discovered them performing in anything like a magical manner. It's so difficult to tell. There's also a question of finance. I have an incurable habit of paying bills. I've been up and down Regent Street several times looking for that shop. I'm inclined to think, indeed, that in that matter honour is satisfied, and that since Jip's name and address are known to them, I may very well leave it to these people, whoever they may be, to send in their bill in their own time. Christmas Meeting by Rosemary Timperley I have never spent Christmas alone before. It gives me an uncanny feeling, sitting alone in my furnished room, 
with my head full of ghosts and the room full of voices of the past. It's a drowning feeling, all the Christmases of the past coming back in a mud jumble, the childish Christmas with a house full of relations, a tree in the window, sixpences in the pudding and the delicious crinkly stocking in the dark morning, the adolescent Christmas with mother and father, the war and the bitter cold, and the letters from abroad, the first really grown-up Christmas with a lover, the snow and the enchantment, red wine and kisses, and the walk in the dark before midnight, with the ground so white and the stars diamond bright in the black sky, so many Christmases through the year, and now, the first Christmas alone. But not quite loneliness, a feeling of companionship with all the other people who are spending Christmas alone, millions of them, past and present, a feeling that if I close my eyes there will be no past or future, only an endless present which is time, because it is all we ever have. Yes, however cynical you are, however irreligious, it makes you feel queer to be alone at Christmas time. So I am absurdly relieved when the young man walks in. There's nothing romantic about it. I'm a woman of nearly fifty, a spinster schoolmarm with grim dark hair and myopic eyes that once were beautiful. And he's a kid of twenty, rather unconventionally dressed with a flowing wine-coloured tie and a black velvet jacket and brown curls which could do with the taste of the barber's scissors. The effeminacy of his dress is belied by his features, narrow, piercing blue eyes and arrogant, jutting nose and chin. Not that he looks strong. The skin is fine, drawn over the prominent features, and he is very white. He bursts in without knocking, then pauses, says... I'm so sorry, I thought this was my room. He begins to go out, then hesitates and says, Are you alone? Yes. It's queer being alone at Christmas, isn't it? May I stay and talk? I'd be glad if you would. He comes right in and sits down by the fire. I hope you don't think I came here on purpose. I, I really did think it was my room, he explains. I'm glad you made the mistake. But you're a very young person to be alone at Christmas time. I wouldn't go back to the country to my family. It would hold up my work. I'm a writer. I see. I can't help smiling a little. That explains his rather unusual dress, and he takes himself so seriously, this young man. Of course, you mustn't waste a precious moment of writing, I say with a twinkle. No, not a moment. That's what my family won't see. They don't appreciate urgency. Families are never appreciative of the artistic nature. No, they aren't, he agrees seriously. What are you writing? Poetry and a diary combined. It's called My Poems and I by Francis Randall. That's my name. My family say there's no point in my writing, that I'm too young. But I don't feel young. Sometimes I feel like an old man with too much to do before he dies. Revolving faster and faster on the wheel of creativeness. Yes, yes, exactly. You understand. You must read my work sometime. Please read my work. Read my work. A note of desperation in his voice, a look of fear in his eyes makes me say, we're both getting much too solemn for Christmas Day. I'm going to make you some coffee, and I have a plum cake. I move about clattering cups, spooning coffee into my percolator, but I must have offended him, for when I look around, I find he has left me. I'm absurdly disappointed. I finish making coffee, however, then turn to the bookshelf in my room. It's piled high with volumes, for which the landlady has apologised profusely. Hope you don't mind the books, miss, but my husband won't part with them, and there's nowhere else to put them. We charge a bit less for the room for that reason. I don't mind, I said. Books are good friends. But these aren't very friendly-looking books. I take one at random. What does some strange fate guide my hand? Sipping my coffee, inhaling my cigarette smoke, I begin to read the battered little book, published, I see, in spring, 1852. It's mainly poetry, immature stuff, but vivid. Then there's a kind of diary, more realistic, less affected. Out of curiosity, if there are any amusing comparisons, I turn to the entry for Christmas Day, 1851. I read, My first Christmas Day alone. I had rather an odd experience. When I went back to my lodgings after a walk, there was a middle-aged woman in my room. I thought at first I'd walked into the wrong room, but this was not so. And later, after a pleasant talk, she disappeared. I suppose she was a ghost, but I wasn't frightened. I liked her. 
but I don't feel well tonight, not at all well. I have never felt ill at Christmas before. A publisher's note followed the last entry. Francis Randall died from a sudden heart attack on the night of Christmas Day, 1851. The woman mentioned in this final entry in his diary was the last person to see him alive. In spite of a request for her in spite of a request for her to come forward, she never did. Her identity remains a mystery. Savior Gate by Russell Kirk. This ain't nicht, this ain't nicht, every nicht and alla. Fire and sleet and candle licht, and Christ receive thy soul. A like wake dirge. This old street, scarcely wider than a lane, could not be long. At the far end of it there loomed a Norman tower of a parish church. Mark Findlay had the notion that if he were to hurry the length of the street and turn to the right beyond the church, he might reach a modern square with cinemas and a taxi rank. Needing to catch the midnight train for London, he must find a cab soon. And, his cough growing worse, he must get out of the wet. In Northminster, this Christmas Eve, a light snow had fallen, then melted, lingering as fog. Between trains, he'd strolled the streets for nearly three hours, his head so filled with worries that he scarcely had noticed anything he passed. Looking back the way he had come, and coughing hard, he saw by the great clock on the cathedral tower that it was nearly half-past eleven. In more ways than one, he had lost his sense of direction. He was uncertain what way the railway station lay. This was a charming, narrow street of Georgian houses, or perhaps some of them from Queen Anne's time, two or three little whitewashed steps going up to each door, that he could make out with the low-lying chilly mist. There seemed to be no shop fronts, and only one hanging signboard, a few yards directly in front of him, visible by gaslight, this being perhaps the only lane in Northminster still lit by gas lamps. The Cross Keys, Paul Mariner, resident manager. Above this gilt lettering was the well-painted symbol of two crossed keys. Decades ago had he glimpsed this street sometime, he had been in Northminster only once before, early in the war. Much of the town had been uglified since then, but this street, supposing it to be the same street, looked unchanged. Had he seen that pub sign before? As he lingered on the corner, coughing ferociously, a clergyman brushed past him in the dim light. Could you tell me, Finley began, but the parson hurried on, umbrella over his head. Perhaps he had taken Finley for a tramp, what with his cough, his pale face and his mud-splashed coat. Someone else, looking rather like a civil servant, was striding in the opposite direction, on the other side of the street. "'I'm sorry, but could you help me?' Findlay called to him. A smug face was turned toward him briefly, but there was no slackening of pace, and the second man went round the corner. Somewhere he must get directions. Should he go a few paces down that street, ring the bell for the porter, if there might be a night porter at a small hotel of this sort nowadays?' and ask his way to a cab rank or to the station. He hesitated, but the past several months he had evaded most decisions, big or small. Yes, he had best try the cross keys. The stained glass windows were alight in that church at the far end, Findlay noticed as he made his way past the Georgian doors, and a bell was tolling from the tower. Just as he was about to mount the stone steps, another coughing fit racked him. Bent and hacking, he leaned towards the bow front of the cross keys. Then the hotel door opened, and down the steps to him came a lean man. "'That's a graveyard cough,' the man said sympathetically. "'I could hear you in the parlour. "'It wasn't the cough that carried him off, but the coffin they carried him off in. "'Do come in for a whisky. "'Startled, Finley contrived to gasp. "'I need to catch a train.' "'The man had taken his arm, a forceful, tall man, with a whimsical, handsome face. "'Hacking like that, you'll never reach the station. "'This stranger. "'But was he quite a stranger?' told him. I'll see that you make your train if you must. He held open the heavy door. Within the corridor was warm and colourful, with dark oak wainscoting and good framed prints on the walls. But it's after hours, Finley protested. Oh, the public bar's closed, but at the cross keys they always conserve something to a bona fide traveller like you. 
The man was briskly helping him off with his muddy coat. Come into the residence parlour. I've put up for the night and the manager knows me. I don't think there's time, Finley muttered as he was propelled into the parlour. This insistent host, who seemed tolerably sober, spoke like an educated man and behaved, like an officer. Time? The lean man chuckled. It's time, gentlemen, time. That's no problem for you and me, is it? I say, you're a Canadian, aren't you? I know you. You're Finley, Mark Finley. I was thinking of you, coincidence, I'd have said once, before I heard that cough of yours in the street. Finley stared into that confident face. Had he known this man? A certain recklessness made those bold features memorable. Perhaps this man had been a soldier. To Finley came some faint memory of an hour's tipsy talk, a curious conversation with a man who had looked rather like this long ago. Some chance acquaintance, but encountered where? Did we meet? Why, right here in 39, Finley inquired. I'm sorry, but I don't recall your name. I'm Ralph Bain. Of course it's here. Take that chair, the lever one, Finley. Jimmy! A corpulent, florid-faced porter or waiter in scarlet jacket and brass buttons ambled toward them. Whiskey and sodas, Jimmy, Bain ordered, and put more coals on that fire. You remember Mr. Finley, Jimmy? He's passing through Northminster, unless, after all, we can persuade him to take a room. Anyhow, he's bona fide. It's your sort that makes this job a pleasure, Mr. Finley, sir, said Jimmy, who was an Irishman. The fire blazed up on the broad hearth below the Adam chimney place. The whisky glasses came promptly on a heavy silver tray. Finley had ceased to cough. Surely this was the jolly hotel of his dim memory with the faded upholstery or shiny leather of its easy chairs, the green draperies of his tall windows, the solid dark furniture of yesteryear, the big oriental rug a bit frayed, and especially that massive framed painting of the Highland cattle. Now he even recalled a looming silver tea urn on the mahogany sideboard. A few people still sat in this residence parlour, perhaps waiting for the midnight peal from the cathedral's bells. Several of them had nodded to him or smiled at him when Bain almost had forced him into an armchair, and an old lady said, Good evening. Could he have seen her before? Or perhaps the granddaughter of the girl companion beside her? Ralph Bain he did recollect fairly well by this time. Rather a wag, this Bain, he recalled with a talent for telling stories that seemed tall. They had taken to each other, he and Bain, when in that year or so long vanished they had happened to fall into talk in this very pub. The Bain of Finley's memory had seemed no younger than a man who sat opposite him now. His host must be remarkably well preserved, not a grey hair to his head. Did he dye his hair? Bain had been chatting with him lightly for several minutes, but Finley, needing to catch that train and fretting about tomorrow's hard decisive conference, scarcely had paid attention. What a heartening room this was, everyone in it good-natured and healthy-looking. The sound of the ancient church bell penetrated through the thick drapes of the bow front. Yes, it was a single bell tolling, not a peal. At any moment, Finley feared the tolling might be mingled with the chimes of the cathedral clock, sounding the third quarter of the hour, which would mean that he'd have a narrow squeak to make his train, even though the trains generally ran late or lingered at the platform. Bain noticed that his guest was listening to the bell. That's a good sound, isn't it, Finley? Lord knows when that church commenced the custom. There was a Saxon or Danish church on the site, you know. The day before Christmas, from time out of mind, they've tolled that bell from early morning to midnight, one stroke for every year since the nativity. The church is our friend Canon Hoodman's, you remember, besides his being chapter treasurer. They must be coming close to stroke 1,939. Shall we drink to that? Thanks, Mr. Bain, Finley heard himself saying. He was drowsy in this cordial room after the long ride down from Aberdeen and after tramping those Northminster streets in miserable vacillation. But no, I'd order another round for us except for my train. I'm going to have to say good night. We keep a flight in Aberdeen now. If you ever get up to, call me Bain or Ralph or Rafe. That whiskey's your medicine, Finlay. I told you so before your cough stopped. As for the train, why, you'll be aboard it, if you really mean to be. I give you my word. I'll see you to the cab. We have heard the chimes at midnight, Master Shallow. Forgive me, but you've not been long this side of the border, I take it. They came down from Aberdeen today, Bain, and if I don't meet three important men for breakfast at the Hyde Park Hotel, here Findlay grimaced, it's all up with me. I've been in oil rigs in Aberdeen for the past two years. I'm not so young as I was, and my wife's in a bad way. Now, I'm in deep trouble. Not enough ready money, and the bank's pressing me hard about the overdrafts. The careless smile faded from Bain's rough mouth. Bain stared at him incredulously. Why, Findlay, that sort of thing doesn't signify for you and me here, you know. Overdrafts? Oh, don't you know? Don't you, actually? 
The moment I dragged you in, I thought you seemed a bit odd. If you don't mind me saying so, it was as if I'd taken hold of a ghost. I'm told that some people scarcely are aware of the change when they've just crossed the border. If you don't mind, Mark Finley, old man, just how was it you died? Jimmy was setting two more whiskies before them on the little Indian table. Bane must have given him a sign. The cosy parlour went round for Finley. Hadn't he thought too often of dying, and dying swiftly, whatever the consequences? Hadn't he thought of that escape all the hours he'd walked down those Northminster streets? Did the death urge show in his face? For a moment, the two commercial travellers in the corner, and the old lady with her girl companion, and smiling Jimmy, seemed to fade into nothingness. Finley saw only Bane's daredevil face gone sober and pallid on the instant. Had one whisky been too many for Bane, or for himself? What do you mean? Finley tried not to stammer. I'm no deader than you are. I might as well be dead, though, if I'm not in London eight hours from now. Dead? Bane laughed, though it seemed to require some effort from him, almost as if Bane were frightened. Of course we're not dead, old man. Here, do I seem dead? Leaning forward, he gripped Finley's hand. There, a good fleshy shake, eh? Why, we wouldn't be just here if we were dead, truly dead, would we, Finley? I put the question to you too bluntly. That's one of my silly habits got in the army. What I meant to say was this. How did you cross the border? Bane drank, and then resumed. There's no harm in calling it dying. We all have to pass through the jaws of death to reach the cross keys, or any other good sort of place. Corruption, putting on incorruption and all that. We all have to die so that we can rise, don't we? Was it, was it hard, your crossing? Is the cross keys the first place you've come to this side of eternity? If so, there's the more honour for me as the first friend to greet you. Bane drained his glass. Now, drink your dram, old man, because there's nothing left for us to fret about. Never, never. It wasn't the cough that carried him off, but the coffin they carried him off in, I say. Could it have been that you crossed the border just outside the door of this hotel when I heard you hacking there? Finley stood up. Was this host of his drunk, or was he a lunatic? Bane seemed neither, but he might be both. Had he and Bane talked of something like this so long ago? Not this precisely, but something about death and eternity? Finley couldn't be bothered, though Bane was rather amusing. Not with that train to catch. Thanks again, he told Bane. My train won't wait, and it's not just my own future depending on that breakfast tomorrow. There's my wife, my sick wife, to think of. Good night. If you're ever in Aberdeen... You really don't follow me, do you, old man? Bane frowned in seeming perplexity. If you leave now, you'll miss Canon Hoodman. Train won't wait. Why, any train you want will be waiting for you whenever you want it. I'll be taking a train myself to Ayrshire after a night or two here at the Cross Keys. There's a young woman I mean to walk the moors with. Time doesn't signify. There's no time for you and me, thank God, Finley. Why, we've not even begun to talk. How can I explain? You and I aren't dead. Though I died once, and I suppose you have too. We've only just begun to live fully. Look here, Mark Finley, do you believe in what you read in the papers? Half the time. Excuse me, but where did you hang my hat and coat? Jimmy, Bane called, but he did not tell Jimmy to fetch his guest's coat and hat. Jimmy, find us today's post, and the Times too. Mr Finley needs to see them. Newspapers inserted in those old-fangled wooden rods were hanging by the sideboard. It passed through Finley's mind that the Cross Keys Hotel, like a beetle of a hostelry preserved in amber, retained amenities that had vanished nearly everywhere else. Jimmy brought two papers. They were full of news about the military stalemate. On the front page of both, the date was 24th September 1939. What the hell is this? Finley was two-thirds angry. It was 1939 when it came to Northminster the first time. This is now, said Bane. There's only now, praise be, whatever now you like, whatever now I like. Sit down, old man. You need somebody with a head and a tongue better than mine to inform you. I say, Jimmy, Canon Hoodman still is in the house talking to Mr. Mariner. Could you give him my compliments and ask him to join us if it's no trouble to him? Tell him that I may even have a ghost to show him. Well, in any event, he must have missed his train by this time, Finley reckoned. After all, how much did that matter? Those three insufferable men at the Hyde Park Hotel would do nothing for him, as the odds stood. The intended meeting had been a last forlorn hope. Fortune had conspired against him and the stars in their courses. He might as well finish this whisky. He might as well finish many whiskies. Now it was all over for him. And all over for Marion. Poor sick Marion. She had told him he would fail. His nerve had failed him and he had failed her. In his bag, 
At the station luggage room there lay secreted a sufficient quantity of prescribed capsules, long hoarded. He had feared that he might require them, the whole lot of them, after that Hyde Park breakfast. After he should leave this hotel, he could swallow them at the station without having to face that grim breakfast after all. Now he had all the time in the world. If a coroner should call it an overdose, there would be some insurance money left for Marion anyway, despite their having borrowed heavily these past six months. It is a far, far better thing I do, Finley sat down again. There were worse places to spend one's last evening than this snug and well-appointed hotel parlour with this friendly madman to entertain him. Jimmy, said Finley, another round of drinks. Nothing matters now. Bain had been peering at him, as if doubting whether this guest were flesh and blood. Actually, Bain said, it does matter, don't you know, old man? It matters if you've not yet crossed the border. It matters if really you're here at the Cross Keys by some uncanny chance, or by providence, I should say. If you're to understand Canon Hoodman, who explains mysteries as well as anybody could, you're not to be half seas over. I beg your pardon, Jimmy. Forget those whiskey sodas and bring us a pot of tea. And some sandwiches, Jimmy. His last slim hope of survival abandoned. Finley was willing to humour this quizzical lunatic called Ralph Bain. He did feel hungry after those vain, bewildered hours in the foggy streets. All right, he told Bain, have your fun with me. That was a clever ploy, putting those old newspapers on the racks. Were you merely hoping that some fool, any fool, might come in tonight and be teased by you? Or do you play these macabre tricks at this hotel every night? Why am I a ghost and not you? It's a private joke, very nearly, that ghost, Bain said. The canon and I call anybody a ghost who turns up here, or turns up anywhere else in eternity but doesn't belong, anybody who hasn't properly crossed the border but gets into eternity somehow, for a moment, so to speak, and then passes back into time again. Let me tell you, Finley, you're a rarity. Here at the old cross keys on Christmas Eve, in the year of our Lord, 1939, reading in the papers about the Twilight War, you're experiencing a timeless moment. You're in two states of being simultaneously, I fancy. Bain leaned towards him earnestly. Yet I don't think you've passed through the jaws of death. The canon says he's met such people more than once, but I haven't. You believe you're alive, and so you are, though not only in the way you think of life. I fancy you'll leave this pleasant room whenever you need to, and you'll catch that confounded train of yours, and you'll find yourselves back in whatever year of grace you fancy you belong in. That's why I call you a ghost. Bain grinned at him reassuringly. You don't belong here, and yet you do belong. To me, you're unreal. You frighten me a trifle, as ghosts are supposed to. The next thing I know, I may be looking straight through you at the back of the chair. You needn't dread me. Oh, but here's the tea, and here's the cannon. The cannon's grip was as hearty as Bain's. Canon Hoodman was a cheerful North Countryman with a broad mouth and thick spectacles. You may not remember me, Mark Finley began, not just yet, or you may recall only a few words we spoke to each other. If you like, I can offer you a good many more words now. Canon Ben was saying, I lug in an old acquaintance from the street and then find he's not crossed the border, or so he says. It's a conundrum. When first you and Finley and I sat down together, I wished we could go on talking forever and hear the possibilities come to pass, but Finley doesn't understand and he wants to be off immediately to his private misery. Was this purported canon some actor recruited by the whimsical Bane? Certainly Hoodman looked his part, collar and black suit and all. Finley forced himself to enter into the spirit of this rag. Here is the question, Finley told Hoodman. Is Ralph Bane crazy or am I? I'd like to know what sort of innkeeper puts 1939 newspapers into this residence parlour. You seem out of sorts, Finley Hoodman said, but melancholy men are the wittiest. The manager of this hotel is a very sensible person, and he puts those papers there because he, like everybody else in this house, knows that tonight is Christmas Eve. The verger is nearly done tolling the bell in my old church, in the year of our Lord, 1939. Another wag, Finley chuckled mordantly, pouring himself another cup of tea with shaking hand. Are you suggesting, Canon, if you really are a Canon, that I'm in hell, having coughed myself to death in the street outside? and that I am condemned to spend eternity in this room, a little pocket of time called December the 24th, 1939. The canon smiled, a warm and humorous smile. Oh, contraire, Finley, if you and Bain and I were in hell, I fancy we'd not be discussing these mysteries. The damned, as I understand it, have no past and no future, no memories, no expectations. You're in a very different state from that. 
This sly game wasn't unpleasant and afterwards there would be those deadly capsules at the station, the door out of this prison house of life leading to the jail yard. With that final ace in the hole, why not play up? Well then, Canon Hoodman, Finley went on, if we three and the other people in this parlour are in prison forever in a cosy moment in time, how is it that you and Bane talk of remembering me? And how can I remember Bane, though I've forgotten you, if I ever met you before? If we're all dead men, how can we talk about memories and expectations, especially expectations? I told you, old man, Bane thrust in, we're not dead, none of us. We've come fully alive. And we're not locked up here, it's just that we've chosen or fallen into this one timeless moment. It's a good particular timeless moment, isn't it? No special significance to it, I suppose. Simply three friends arguing comfortably before a fire on a winter's night. But we have our choices of moments to experience afresh. It's up to you and the canon and me separately. This moment is a random sample of timeless moments. There are stronger moments, far stronger for any of us. Why, if he chose just now, the canon might be praying some drafty church at Smokefall, I suppose, or could be trading stories with some good chaps in a tent in the western desert, say, instead of disputing with you. It's a question of what you wish to experience all over again. As they talked, the heavy tolling of that church bell contributed to the illusion of timelessness that these two fantastics had contrived for him. Outside in the street there sounded the footfalls and murmuring of a good many people with now and again children's laughter, folk on their way to midnight service at that church. The hotel was real, the people outside were real, these two clever companions of his were real. Findlay wondered about his own reality. The canon was speaking now. Yes, all good moments or hours or days that you ever experienced are forever present to you, whenever you want them, after you've crossed the border. We were told that we shall have bodies, we have them. You say that you've not yet crossed the border, Finley. Well, once you have crossed, and if really you're still in time, that might be a long while yet for you, then, God willing, you'll understand, as we two can't make you understand. What's wrong with the present everlasting moment, Bane inquired. Ah, I know, no cigars. Jimmy, fetch that box of cigars. Finley chose a cigar, presumably his last, a Burma cheroot. He seemed to recall that good Burma cheroots had been easier to find in 1939. Where nowadays did the resident manager of the Cross Keys obtain his supply? All right, Finley responded, keeping his temper despite this waggery. For the sake of argument, I'll accept your metaphysics. We're not dead, but in eternity, you say. Well, what sort of great expectations are we supposed to indulge, aside from another sandwich and another cigar? You two talk well, but this occasion might turn boring if it were to run on forever. The canon took him up. As Bane said, it's your choice of all you've experienced. Suppose that your wedding day was among the best days of your life, Mark, or what you call your life. Think of this. You can experience that wedding whenever you like, for eternity. You mean that I can remember my wedding day? I don't need you to tell me that, canon. You mean that happiness is emotion recollected in tranquility. That's not enough for me. I don't have any tranquility left. The canon shook his head amicably. No, it's not memory that I mean. It's this, rather, if you're given grace, the good things of your life are experienced in all the fullness of your senses whenever you desire them. True, there's another side to the coin. If you've rejected the grace of God, then the evil things of your life are forever present, and you can't escape them. This unexpected moment here in the Cross Keys may be a sign for you, Mark Finley, a sign that you may know grace in death if you choose it. Ah, how these two jesters, these masters of the dry mock, stuck to their hobgoblin consistency. Finley laughed sardonically. So you two can convert yourselves into bridegrooms in the twinkling of an eye whenever you're in that mood. Not I, Bane admitted. I never married. I joined my regiment a few weeks after we met here, Finley, and I was good at killing, but at nothing else. After El Alamein, where I took some bullets, they gave me the military cross. When the war was over, I got my little pension and drank hard every day. Any girl would have been an idiot to have married me. I asked one, and she said it would never do, and she was right. That's the young woman I mean to walk on the moors again with when I leave the Cross Keys. Why trouble yourself with her, Finley objected, grinning. There's no marriage or giving in marriage, I'm told, where we three are supposed to be just now. Or can you have your fun all the same? So far as marriage goes, Bain said quietly, we don't want what we didn't know at the other side of the border. As for fun, I found in the end that love was better. Have you ever read Augustine? The canon asked Finley. No, he learned that truth while he was still in time. I take it, canon, you can chat with St. Augustine 
whenever the fit is on you. Finley scoffed. And that Bane can play games with Helen of Troy. Oh, nothing of that sort, the canon paused. How may I make it clear? We live only once, and the experiences of that one active life are eternal. I don't meet Augustine in the Cross Keys Hotel, say, because he never was here, naturally, and because I wasn't at Hippo in the 5th century, naturally. Augustine and you and I are joined only through the mystical body. As for Bane, may I speak for you, Bane, and our stroll in the moors of that lady merely talking means more to him than could be the conquest of the face that launched a thousand ships. We don't long for the physical presence of Augustine or of Helen, because the reality which we know satisfies us, which it didn't when we were in time. I don't mean that this fuller reality of ours is static. Instead, our awareness of every timeless moment grows deeper and takes on more meaning. For a small instance, though you and I talked in this room before, you don't remember a word I said. I suspect, however, that you'll not forget what I'm saying to you now. What about these expectations of yours, when there's nothing new under the sun for you? When you do nothing but enlarge the same experiences, Finley thought he had caught this subtle canon there. Expectations, Finley, this living moment in the cross keys isn't the whole of the life eternal. Hardly, the canon chuckled. Nor is the reenactment of the love of created things the whole of what we expect. You know the phrase the beatific vision? Well, that's not a phrase only. That vision is yet to come for Bane and for me. Perhaps we experience a provisional judgment now and so remain tied in some sense, to experiences within time. When the last judgment's done, perhaps all expectations will be fulfilled, so that there'll be nothing left to long for. These are only words to you. Formerly, they weren't much more than words to me. Words are tools that break in the hand. After you cross the border, you'll know the truths that I can't put into words for you. There's the last desperate resort of Parsons, Finley thought, flight into bloodless abstractions, empty formulas. He would try another track. I fancy you must have been a model of propriety, Bane, to deserve a comfortable birth in eternity like this, eh? I didn't deserve it at all, Bane looked down at his strong hands. I told you, I was good for nothing but killing, and that was true to the very end, until almost the last. I was all ego, loving nobody but myself. My last action was to destroy a man, or what had been a man. Men are always saying that they'd die for this woman or that one. I said it too, but what mattered... I did it, for that young woman I mentioned. I did it to shield her from somebody, and I took him with me. It was a beastly business on a high roof, and we went down together, into a river. Do you know, Findlay, ordinarily we don't talk about crossing the border. I took the liberty of asking you how you crossed, but only because I sensed that there was something peculiar about your coming. It's bad form, since nasty memories don't fit in here. Yet, in its way, even that last fight of mine was a high experience. That one decent impulse of mine is why I'm in the same room with the cannon. Because of that violent act for love, she'd never have taken me. Everything else I'd done was forgiven. Except for the tolling of the bell, there was silence for a little space. Finley had to admire Bane for his consummate skill of straight-faced yarn spinning. Then Bane added, Now, beyond desire, I'm her friend and know her always. Just like Dante and Beatrice, Finley commented, puffing dryly on his cheroot. Rather, said the canon, knocking the ash from his cigar, like Dante and Beatrice. How often did these two saturnine comedians find the opportunity to pull some chance visitor's leg so systematically? You gave your life too for a female friend, Canon Hoodman. No, the canon answered. I had no choice as to how I crossed. My wife and I crossed together. I believe a bomb struck our old house in the close, so we've never been parted. She'll be in the congregation when I give the homily at midnight service and we walk back to the close, together. People who come after us in time don't know that handsome old house of ours, more's the pity, but nothing that's in time can endure forever. For my wife and me, nevertheless, every stick and brick of that house endures in eternity. They couldn't really expect him to swallow all this farrago. Of course, these two were aware that he knew they talked tongue-in-cheek. They hoped to provoke him into an outburst of indignation at such stuff and nonsense. Finley wouldn't let them have that satisfaction. So, you have the pleasure of your wife's company, Canon, he said smoothly, and you enjoy your lady friend's conversation, Bane. That's pleasant. But what about souls you're not so fond of? That man who rolled off the roof into the river with you, for instance, Bane. That foul chap, Bane blew a smoke ring. God only knows. You can be sure our paths don't cross. In our father's house there are many mansions, but they're not all on the same floor. 
Finley yawned. The jest was wearing thin and he was dog-tired, and in his luggage those capsules awaited him. These two jesters might be sobered by what they would read about him in the tomorrow's papers. After all, his would be the cream of the jest. You're quite worn out, Finley, I can see, the canon was murmuring. And we've been boring you. Jimmy, is that Mr Mariner still up? Good, ask him to come if he has a moment. The manager of this old-fashioned hotel turned out to be a small, quick man with deep-set eyes. Something for you, Captain Bain. Mariner, Bain said to him. Our friend Finley has come a long way. Show him one of your rooms, will you? He still thinks of taking a train, but he might be tempted. This is a very old house, Finley. Part of the building medieval. Worth seeing. Worth sleeping in. Would you prefer a haunted chamber, Mr. Finley, Mariner offered. Apparently he was a confederate of Bain and Hoodman. I don't know that we can supply a spectral monk on demand, but there's a room available where Coleridge slept once. Mariner led the three of them up a short flight of carpeted stairs, down a longish corridor, up a longer and steeper flight, and round a corner. Behind the door which he opened was a snug single bedroom. Massive beams in its low ceiling papered in blue, with a glistening old bedstead of some rare wood. If you'd care to sleep deep, Mr. Finley, Mariner said, I'd wake you when you might require a call, supposing that you should want it at all. I must have missed that train of mine long ago, thanks to these gentlemen, Finley answered. The sleep in that old bed for eternity. That prospect was far more attractive than were those capsules waiting at the station. It's your choice entirely, Bain was saying in his ear. Free will, you know, old man. Yet why choose either bed or poison? These chance companions with their long-faced wit had cared enough about him to twit him for an hour. Somehow they'd put heart into him. His cough seemed to have faded away altogether, and these two friends and the atmosphere of this old house were invigorating. He wouldn't swallow those capsules tonight, after all, he decided. Perhaps never. But Marion mustn't be left to suffer alone, and there were the sensibilities of railway porters to think of. Hyde Park breakfast or no Hyde Park breakfast, something yet might be accomplished in London with somebody or other, given will, given spirit, given grace. Behind this evening's charade, there had moved some quickening power, some hint or glimpse of hope. How a man dies, and with what justification, this absurd interval of talk had wakened Finley to awareness of such matters. He would not plunge himself into nothingness without another effort or two. Canon Hoodman had been watching him closely. If you feel ready for a bed, the canon remarked, laying a hand on Finley's shoulder, you'll not find a better one than this, Mark. But if you've got duties you can't ignore, why, there's always a London train for you. No thanks, gentlemen, Finley said. I have miles to go before I sleep. Bain nodded. You still have hostages to fortune, eh? And after all... That bed can be yours whenever you need it. I'll walk you to the corner. At the front door, Finley shook hands with the canon and Mariner. The two of them, if Mariner was privy to the plot, kept up to the last their roguish elaborate pretense. We'll have more to discuss when you come to us, the canon told him. I don't expect to pass this way again. Yet you shall. Finley and Bain went down the white steps and into the drifting mist. The canon waved. That short street, it turned out, was quite as lovely as Finley had thought it to be, in his glimpses before Bain had drawn him into the cross keys. If only he could have lingered to inspect it more closely. Ahead of them, the stragglers were hastening through the churchyard and into the lighted church, and that bell tolled on. Do you have any idea when the first morning train will leave, Bain? It'll be there for you, old man, and all of us at the cross keys will be there for you when you look for us. Ask the cabby. Then the bell ceased to toll. Finley glanced at his watch. He must have stopped in the cross keys. He looked backward toward the cathedral tower, yet surely the cathedral clock too had run down, and at the same time, for it stood at half past eleven. Here you are, Mark, Bain was telling him. Do you make out a cab rank to the right? Just wave and shout. Wage the good fight, old man. Sure enough, there was a taxi a few yards distant on the modern street which intersected this ancient lane. Finley waved and shouted and the taxi rolled to him. To the station, sir, the driver was asking now. Just a moment, Ralph, you rascal. You've given me a lively evening, though. Finley turned to face Ralph Bain. Bain was not to be seen. Nor was the Cross Keys Hotel, only a vacant site strewn with rubble. The charming houses of the old street were gone, or at least most of them, and those which survived were ghastly derelicts. That street was wholly lifeless. Finley swung back toward the taxi, 
Beyond it was the church with the Norman tower, or rather the wreck of a church, all dark, no glass in what remained of the window tracery. The nave was roofless, a mercury vapour lamp in the modern street glowered over the churchyard, and by it Finley could make out a metal sign which read, Public Gardens, Custody of the Ministry of Works. Station, sir. Time enough to catch the midnight train for London. You can hear it rumbling down from the north now. Finley tumbled into the cab. Tell me, tell me, how long has that street been smashed? Before my time. 1941, they say. Them German firebombs done for it. Some year, they say, the corporation will get round to building council houses there. And what's the name of that street? Saviour Gate, sir. The Snow by Hugh Walpole The second Mrs. Ryder was a young woman, not easily frightened, but now she stood in the dusk of the passage, leaning back against the wall, her hand on her heart, looking at the grey-faced window, beyond which the snow was steadily falling against the lamplight. The passage where she was led from the study to the dining room, and the window looked out onto the little paved path that ran at the edge of the cathedral green, as she stared down the passage, she couldn't be sure whether the woman were there or no. How absurd of her! She knew the woman wasn't there. But if the woman wasn't, how was it she could discern so clearly the old-fashioned grey cloak, the untidy grey hair, and the sharp outline of the pale cheek and pointed chin? Yes, and more than that, the long sweep of the grey dress falling in folds to the ground, the flash of a gold ring on the white hand. No, 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 this was madness. There was no one and nothing there. Hallucination. Very faintly a voice seemed to come to her. I warned you. This is for the last time. The nonsense. How far now was her imagination to carry her? Tiny sounds about the house, the running of a tap somewhere, a faint voice from the kitchen. These and something more had translated themselves into an imagined voice. The last time. But her terror was real. She was not normally frightened by anything. She was young and healthy and bold, fond of sport, hunting, shooting, taking any risk. Now she was truly stiffened with terror. She couldn't move, couldn't advance down the passage as she wanted to, and find light, warmth, safety in the dining room. All the time the snow fell steadily, stealthily, with its own secret purpose, maliciously, beyond the window in the pale glow of the lamplight. Then, unexpectedly, there was a noise from the hall, opening of doors, a rush of feet, a pause, and then, in clear, beautiful voices, the well-known strains of Good King Wenceslas. It was the cathedral choir boys on their regular Christmas round. This was Christmas Eve. They always came just at this hour on Christmas Eve. With an intense, almost incredible relief, she turned back into the hall. At the same moment her husband came out of the study. They stood together smiling at a little group of muffled, becoated boys who were singing heart and soul in the job so that the old house simply rang with their melody. Reassured by the warmth and human company, she lost her terror. It had been her imagination. Of late, she had been none too well. That was why she was so irritable. Old Dr. Bernard was no good. He didn't understand her case at all. After Christmas, she would go to London and have the very best advice. Had she been well, she could not half an hour ago have shown such miserable temper over nothing. She knew that it was over nothing, and yet that knowledge didn't make it any easier for her to restrain herself. After every bout of temper, she told herself that there should never be another, and then Herbert said something irritating, one of his silly muddle-headed stupidities, and she was off again. She could see now, as she stood beside him at the bottom of the staircase, that he was still feeling it. She had certainly half an hour ago said some abominably rude, personal things, things that she had not at all meant, and he had taken them in his meek, quiet way. Were he not so meek and quiet, did he only pay her back in her own coin, she would never lose her temper. Of that, she was sure. But who wouldn't be irritated by that meekness and by the only reproachful thing that he ever said to her? Eleanor understood me better, my dear. 
To throw the first wife up against the second, wasn't that the most tactless thing that a man could possibly do? And Eleanor, that worn, elderly woman, the very opposite of her own gay, bright, amusing self. That was why Herbert had loved her, because she was gay and bright and young. It was true that Eleanor had been devoted, that she had been so utterly wrapped up in Herbert that she lived only for him. People were always recalling her devotion, which was sufficiently rude and tactless of them. Well, she couldn't give anyone that kind of old-fashioned sugary devotion. It wasn't in her, and Herbert knew it by this time. Nevertheless, she loved Herbert in her own way, as he must know, know it so well that he ought to pay no attention to the bursts of temper. She wasn't well. She would see a doctor in London. The little boys finished their carols, were properly rewarded, and tumbled like feathery birds out into the snow again. They went into the study, the two of them, and stood beside the big open log fire. She put her hand up and stroked his thin, beautiful cheek. I'm so sorry to have been cross just now, Bertie. I didn't mean half I said, you know. But he didn't, as he usually did, kiss her and tell her that it didn't matter. Looking straight in front of him, he answered, Well, Alice, I do wish you wouldn't. It hurts horribly. It upsets me more than you think, and it's growing on you. You make me miserable. I don't know what to do about it, and it's all about nothing. Irritated at not receiving the usual commendation for her sweetness in making it up again, she withdrew a little and answered, Oh, all right. I've said I'm sorry. I can't do any more. But tell me, he insisted, I want to know, what makes you so angry, so suddenly, and about nothing at all? She was about to let her anger rise, her anger at his obtuseness, obstinacy, when some fear checked her, some strange, unanalyzed fear, as though someone had whispered to her, Look out, this is the last time. It's not altogether my own fault, she answered, and left the room. She stood in the cold hall, wondering where to go. She could feel the snow falling outside the house and shivered. She hated the snow, she hated the winter, this beastly, cold, dark English winter that went on and on, only at last to change into a damp, soggy English spring. In Polchester it was unusual to have so heavy a snowfall. This was the hardest winter that they had known for many years. When she urged Herbert to winter abroad, which he could quite easily do, he answered her impatiently. He had the strongest affection for this pokey, dead-and-alive cathedral town. The cathedral seemed to be precious to him. He wasn't happy if he didn't go and see it every day. She wouldn't wonder if he didn't think more of the cathedral than he did of herself. Eleanor had been the same. She had even written a little book about the cathedral, about the black bishop's tomb and the stained glass and the rest. What was the cathedral, after all? Only a building. She was standing in the drawing-room, looking out over the dusky ghostly snow to the great hulk of the cathedral that Herbert said was like a flying ship, but to herself was more like a crouching beast licking its lips over the miserable sinners that it was forever devouring. As she looked and shivered, feeling that in spite of herself her temper and misery were rising so that they threatened to choke her, it seemed to her that her bright and cheerful firelit drawing-room was suddenly open to the snow. It was exactly as though cracks had appeared everywhere, in the ceiling, the walls, the windows, and that through these cracks the snow was filtering, dribbling in little tracks of wet down the walls, already perhaps making pools of water on the carpet. This was, of course, imagination, but it was a fact that the room was most dreadfully cold, although a great fire was burning, and it was the coziest room in the house. Then, turning... She saw the figure standing by the door. This time, there could be no mistake. It was a grey shadow, and yet a shadow with form and outline. The untidy grey hair, the pale face like a moonlit leaf, the long grey clothes, and something obstinate, vindictive, terribly menacing in its pose. She moved, and the figure was gone. There was nothing there, and the room was warm again, quite hot in fact. But young Mrs. Ryder who had never feared anything in all her life save the vanishing of her youth, was trembling, so that she had to sit down, and even then her trembling did not cease. Her hand shook on the arm of the chair. She had created this thing out of her imagination of Eleanor's hatred of her and her own hatred of Eleanor. It was true that they had never met, but who knew but that spiritualists were right and Eleanor's spirit, jealous of Herbert's love for her, had been there, driving them apart, forcing her to lose her temper and then hating her for losing it. Such things might be, 
but she hadn't much time for speculation. She was preoccupied with her fear. It was a definite, positive fear, the kind of fear that one has just before one goes under an operation. Someone or something was threatening her. She clung to her chair as though to leave it were to plunge into disaster. She looked around her everywhere. All the familiar things, the pictures, the books, the little tables, the piano, were different now, isolated, strange, hostile, as though they had been won over by some enemy power. She longed for Herbert to come and protect her. She felt most kindly to him. She would never lose her temper with him again, and at that same moment some cold voice seemed to whisper into her ear, You had better not. It will be for the last time. At length she found courage to rise, cross the room, and go up to dress for dinner. In her bedroom courage came to her once more. It was certainly very cold, and the snow, as she could see when she looked between her curtains, was falling more heavily than ever. But she had a warm bath, sat in front of her fire, and was sensible again. For many months this odd sense that she was watched, and accompanied by someone hostile to her, had been growing. It was the stronger, perhaps, because of the things that Herbert told her about Eleanor. She was the kind of woman, he said, who once she loved anyone would never relinquish her grasp. She was utterly faithful. He implied that her tenacious fidelity had been at times a little difficult. She always said, he added once, that she would watch over me until I rejoined her in the next world. Poor Eleanor, he sighed. She had a fine religious faith, stronger than mine, I fear. It was always after one of her tantrums that young Mrs. Ryder had been most conscious of this hallucination, this dreadful discomfort of feeling that someone was near you who hated you. But it was only during the last week that she had begun to fancy that she actually saw anyone, and with every day her sense of this figure had grown stronger. It was, of course, only nerves, but it was one of those nervous afflictions that became tiresome indeed, if you didn't rid yourself of it. Mrs. Ryder, secure now in the warmth and intimacy of her bedroom, determined that henceforth everything should be sweetness and light, no more tempers. These were the things that did her harm. Even though Herbert were a little trying, wasn't that the case with every husband in the world? And wasn't it Christmas time? Peace and goodwill to men. Peace and goodwill to Herbert. They sat down opposite to one another in a pretty little dining room hung with Chinese woodcuts, the table gleaming, and the amber curtains richly dark in the firelight. But Herbert wasn't himself. He was still brooding, she supposed, over their quarrel of the afternoon. Weren't men children? Incredible the children they were. So when the maid was out of the room, she went over to him, bent down and kissed his forehead. Darling, you're still cross. I can see you are. You mustn't be. Really, you mustn't. It's Christmas time, and if I forgive you, you must forgive me. You forgive me, he asked, looking at her in his most aggravating way. What have you to forgive me for? Well, that really was too much. When she had taken all the steps, humbled her pride, she went back to her seat, but for a while couldn't answer him because the maid was there. When they were alone again, she said, summoning all her patience, Bertie, dear, do you really think that there's anything to be gained by sulking like this? It isn't worthy of you. It isn't really, he answered her quietly. Sulking? No, that's not the right word, but I've got to keep quiet. If I don't, I shall say something I'm sorry for. Then, after a pause, in a low voice as though to himself, these constant rows are awful. Her temper was rising again, another self that had nothing to do with her real self, a stranger to her, and yet a very old familiar friend. Don't be so self-righteous, she answered, her voice trembling a little. These quarrels are entirely my own fault, aren't they? Eleanor and I never quarrelled, he said, so softly that she scarcely heard him. No, because Eleanor thought you perfect. She adored you. You've often told me. I don't think you perfect. I'm not perfect either. But we both got faults. I'm not the only one to blame. We'd better separate, he said, suddenly looking up. We don't get on now. We used to. I don't know what's changed everything, but, as things are, we'd better separate. She looked at him and knew that she loved him more than ever, but because she loved him so much she wanted to hurt him, and because he had said that he thought he could get on without her, she was so angry that she forgot all caution. Her love and her anger helped one another. The more angry she became, the more she loved him. I know why you want to separate, she said. It's because you're in love with someone else. 
How funny, something inside us said. You don't mean a word of this. You've treated me as you have, and then you leave me. I'm not in love with anyone else, he answered her steadily, and you know it. But we're so unhappy together that it's silly to go on, silly. The whole thing has failed. There was so much unhappiness, so much bitterness in his voice, that she realised that at last she had truly gone too far. She had lost him. She had not meant this. She was frightened, and her fear made her so angry that she went across to him. Very well, then, I'll tell everyone what you've been, how you've treated me. Not another scene, he answered wearily. I can't stand any more. Let's wait. Tomorrow is Christmas Day. He was so unhappy that her anger with herself maddened her. She couldn't bear this sad, hopeless disappointment with herself, their life together, everything. In a fury of blind temper, she struck him. It was as though she was striking herself. He got up and without a word left the room. There was a pause, and then she heard the hall door close. He had left the house. She stood there, slowly coming under her control again. When she lost her temper, it was as though she sank under water. When it was all over, she came once more to the surface of life, wondering where she'd been and what she'd been doing. Now she stood there, bewildered, and then at once she was aware of two things. One, that the room was bitterly cold, and the other, that someone was in the room with her. This time, she didn't need to look around. She did not turn at all, but only stared straight at the curtained windows, seeing them very carefully, as though she were summing them up for some future analysis. With their thick amber folds, gold rod, white lines, and beyond them, the snow was falling. She didn't need to turn, but with a shiver of terror, she was aware that the grey figure who had all these last weeks been approaching ever more closely was almost at her very elbow. She heard her quite clearly. I warned you. That was the last time. At the same moment, Onslow the butler came in. Onslow was broad, fat and rubicund, a good, faithful butler with a passion for church music. He was a bachelor and, it was said, disappointed of women. He had an old mother in Liverpool to whom he was greatly attached. In a flash of consciousness, she thought of all these things when he came in. She expected him also to see the grey figure at her side, but he was undisturbed. His ceremonial complacency clothed him securely. Mr. Fairfax has gone out, she said firmly. Oh, surely he must see something, feel something. Yes, madam. Then smiling rather grandly, it's snowing hard. Never seen it harder here. Shall I build up the fire in the drawing room, madam? No, thank you, but Mr. Fairfax's study. Yes, madam, I only thought that as this room was so warm, you might find it chilly in the drawing room this room warm when she was shivering from head to foot, but holding herself lest he should see. She longed to keep him there, to implore him to remain, but in a moment he was gone, softly closing the door behind him. Then a mad longing for flight seized her, and she couldn't move. She was rooted there to the floor, and even as wildly trying to cry, to scream, to shriek the house down, she found that only a little whisper would come. She felt the cold touch of a hand on hers. She didn't turn her head. Her whole personality, all her past life, her poor little courage, her miserable fortitude, were summoned to meet this sense of approaching death, which was as unmistakable as a certain smell or the familiar ringing of a gong. She had dreamt in nightmares of approaching death, and it had always been like this, a fearful constriction of the heart, a paralysis of the limbs, a choking sense of disaster like an anaesthetic. You were warned, something said to her again. She knew that if she turned, she would see Eleanor's face, set, white, remorseless. The woman had always hated her, been vilely jealous of her, protecting her wretched Herbert. Certain vindictiveness seemed to release her. She found that she could move, her limbs were free. She passed to the door, ran down the passage into the hall. Where could she be safe? She thought of the cathedral where tonight there was a carol service. She opened the hall door and just as she was, meeting the thick, involving, muffling snow, she ran out. She started across the green towards the cathedral door. A thin black slipper sank in the snow. Snow was everywhere, in her hair, her eyes, her nostrils, her mouth, on her bare neck, between her breasts. Help, 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 she wanted to cry, but the snow choked her. Lights whirled about her. The cathedral rose like a huge black eagle and flew towards her. 
She fell forward, and even as she fell, a hand, far colder than the snow, caught her neck. She lay struggling in the snow, and as she struggled there, two hands of an icy, fleshless chill closed about her throat. Her last knowledge was of the hard outline of a ring pressing into her neck. Then she lay still, a face in the snow, and the flakes eagerly, savagely, covered her. Me by A. M. Burridge. No, said Jackson with a shy little smile. I'm sorry, I won't play hide and seek. It was Christmas Eve, and there were fourteen of us in the house. We had had a good dinner, and we were all in the mood for fun and games. All that is, except Jackson. When somebody suggested hide and seek, there were loud shouts of agreement. Jackson's refusal was the only one. It was not like Jackson to refuse to play a game. Aren't you feeling well? Someone asked. I'm perfectly all right, thank you. He said. But he added with a smile that softened his refusal but didn't change it. I'm still not playing hide and seek. Why not? Someone asked. He hesitated for a moment before replying. I sometimes go and stay at a house where a girl was killed. She was playing hide and seek in the dark. She didn't know the house very well. There was a door that led to the servants' staircase. When she was chased, she thought the door led to a bedroom. She opened the door and jumped and landed at the bottom of the stairs. She broke her neck, of course. We all looked serious. Mrs. Fernley said, "How terrible!" And were you there when it happened? Jackson shook his head sadly. "No," he said. "But I was there when something else happened, something worse. What could be worse than that?" This was," said Jackson. He hesitated for a moment, then he said, "I wonder if any of you have ever played a game called Smee. It's much better than hide and seek. The name comes from It's Me, of course. Perhaps you'd like to play it instead of hide and seek. Let me tell you the rules of the game. Every player is given a sheet of paper. All the sheets except one are blank. On the last sheet of paper is written Smee. Nobody knows who Smee is except Smee himself or herself." You turn out the lights, and Smee goes quietly out of the room and hides. After a time, the others go off in search for Smee, but of course they don't know who they're looking for. When one player meets another, he challenges him by saying Smee. The other player answers Smee, and they continue searching. But the real Smee doesn't answer when someone challenges. The second player stays quietly beside him. Presently, they will be discovered by a third player. He will challenge and receive no answer, and he will join the first two. This goes on until all the players are in the same place. The last one to find Smee has to pay a forfeit. It's a good, noisy, amusing game. In a big house, it often takes a long time for everyone to find Smee. Perhaps you'd like to try. I'll happily pay my forfeit and sit here by the fire while you play. It sounds like a good game. I remarked. Have you played it too, Jackson? Yes, he answered. I played it in the house that I was telling you about. And she was there. The girl who broke. No, no," said someone else. He told us he wasn't there when she broke her neck. Jackson thought for a moment. I don't know if she was there or not. I'm afraid she was. I know that there were thirteen of us playing the game, and there were only twelve people in the house. And I didn't know the dead girl's name. When I heard that whispered name in the dark, it didn't worry me. But I tell you, I'm never going to play that kind of game again. It made me quite nervous for a long time. I prefer to pay my forfeit all at once. We all stared at him. His words didn't make sense at all. Tim Voos was the kindest man in the world. He smiled at us. This sounds like an interesting story. He said, "Come on, Jackson. You can tell it to us instead of paying a forfeit." Very well," said Jackson. And here is his story. Have you met the Sangstons? They're cousins of mine, and they live in Surrey. Five years ago, they invited me to go and spend Christmas with them. It was an old house with lots of unnecessary passages and staircases. A stranger could get lost in it quite easily. Well, I went down for that Christmas. Violet Sangston promised me that I knew most of the other guests. Unfortunately, I couldn't get away from my job until Christmas Eve. 
All the other guests had arrived there the previous day. I was the last to arrive, and I was only just in time for dinner. I said hello to everyone I knew, and Violet Sangston introduced me to the people I didn't know. Then it was time to go into dinner. That is perhaps why I didn't hear the name of the tall, dark-haired, handsome girl whom I hadn't met before. Everyone was in rather a hurry, and I'm always bad at catching people's names. She looked cold and clever. She didn't look at all friendly, but she looked interesting, and I wondered who she was. I didn't ask because I was sure that someone would speak to her by name during the meal. Unluckily, however, I was a long way from her at the table. I was sitting next to Mrs. Gorman, and as usual, Mrs. Gorman was being very bright and amusing. Her conversation is always worth listening to, and I completely forgot to ask the name of the dark, proud girl. There were twelve of us, including the Sangstons themselves. We were all young, or trying to be young. Jack and Violet Sangston were the oldest, and their seventeen-year-old son Reggie was the youngest. It was Reggie who suggested to me when the talk turned to games. He told us the rules of the game, just as I've described them to you. Jack Sangston warned us all. If you're going to play games in the dark, he said, please be careful of the back stairs on the first floor. A door leads to them, and I've often thought about taking the door off. In the dark, a stranger to the house could think they were walking into a room. A girl really did break her neck on those stairs. I asked how it happened. It was about ten years ago, before we came here. There was a party, and they were playing hide and seek. The girl was looking for somewhere to hide. She heard somebody coming and ran along the passage to get away. She opened the door, thinking it led to a bedroom. She planned to hide in there until the seeker had gone. Unfortunately, it was the door that led to the back stairs. She fell straight down to the bottom of the stairs. She was dead when they picked her up. We all promised to be careful. Mrs. Gorman even made a little joke about living to be ninety. You see, none of us had known the poor girl, and we didn't want to feel sad on Christmas Eve. Well, we all started the game immediately after dinner. Young Reggie Sangston went round, making sure all the lights were off, except the ones in the servants' room and in the sitting room where we were. We then prepared twelve sheets of paper. Eleven of them were blank, and one of them had "smee" written on it. Reggie mixed them all up. Then we each took one. The person who got the paper with "smee" on it had to hide. I looked at mine and saw that it was blank. A moment later, all the electric lights went out. In the darkness, I heard someone moving very quietly to the door. After a minute, somebody blew a whistle, and we all rushed to the door. I had no idea who was Smee. For five or ten minutes, we were all rushing up and down passages and in and out of rooms, challenging each other and answering, "Smee, Smee." After a while, the noise died down, and I guessed that someone had found Smee. After a time, I found a group of people all sitting on some narrow stairs. I challenged and received no answer, so Smee was there. I hurriedly joined the group. Presently, two more players arrived. Each one was trying to, each one was hurrying to avoid being last. Jack Sangston was last and was given a forfeit. I think we're all here now, aren't we? He remarked. He lit a match, looked up the staircase, and began to count nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. He said, and then laughed. That's silly. There's one too many. The match went out, and he lit another and began to count. He got as far as twelve. Then he looked puzzled. There are thirteen people here," he said. "I haven't counted myself yet." "Oh, nonsense!" I laughed. "You probably began with yourself, and now you want to count yourself twice." His son took out his electric torch. It gave a better light than the matches, and we all began to count. Of course, there were twelve of us. Jack laughed. "Well," he said, "I was sure I counted thirteen twice." From halfway up the stairs, Violet Sangston spoke nervously. "I thought there was somebody sitting two steps above me." Have you moved, Captain Ransom? The captain said that he hadn't. But I thought there was somebody sitting between Mrs. Sangston and me. Just for a moment, there was an uncomfortable something in the air. A cold finger seemed to touch us all. For that moment, we all felt that something odd and unpleasant had just happened, and was likely to happen again. Then we laughed at ourselves and at each other, and we felt normal again. There were only twelve of us, and that was that. Still laughing, we marched back to the sitting room to begin again. This time, I was Smee. Violet Sangston found me while I was searching for a hiding place. That game didn't last long. Soon there were twelve people, and the game was over. Violet felt cold and wanted a jacket. Her husband went up to their bedroom to fetch it. As soon as he'd gone, Reggie touched me on the arm. He was looking pale and sick. Quick, he whispered. 
I've got to talk to you. Something horrible has happened. We went into the breakfast room. What's the matter? I asked. I don't know. You were Smee last time, weren't you? Well, of course, I didn't know who Smee was. While Mother and the others ran to the west side of the house and found you, I went east. There's a deep clothes cupboard in my bedroom. It looked like a good hiding place. I thought that perhaps Smee might be there. I opened the door in the dark and touched somebody's hand. Smee? I whispered. There was no answer. I thought I'd found Smee. Well, I don't understand it, but I suddenly had a strange, cold feeling. I can't describe it, but I felt that something was wrong. So I turned on my electric torch, and there was nobody there. Now I'm sure I touched a hand, and nobody could get out of the cupboard because I was standing in the doorway. What do you think? You imagined that you touched a hand, I said. He gave a short laugh. I knew you'd say that, he said. Of course I imagined it. That's the only explanation, isn't it? I agreed with him. I could see that he still felt shaken. Together we returned to the sitting room for another game of Smee. The others were all ready and waiting to start again. Perhaps it was my imagination, although I'm almost sure that it wasn't. But I had a feeling that nobody was really enjoying the game anymore, but everybody was too polite to mention it. All the same, I had the feeling that something was wrong. All the fun had gone out of the game. Something deep inside me was trying to warn me. Take care, it whispered. Take care. There was some unnatural, unhealthy influence at work in the house. Why did I have this feeling? Because Jack Sangston had counted 13 people instead of 12? Because his son imagined he'd touched someone's hand in an empty cupboard? I tried to laugh at myself, but I didn't succeed. Well, we started again. While we were all chasing the unknown Smee, we were all as noisy as ever, but it seemed to me that most of us were just acting. We were no longer enjoying the game. At first I stayed with the others, but for several minutes no Smee was found. I left the main group and started searching on the first floor at the west side of the house, and there, while I was feeling my way along, I bumped into a pair of human knees. I put out my hand and touched a soft, heavy curtain. Then I knew where I was. There were tall, deep windows with window seats at the end of the passage. The curtains reached to the ground. Someone was sitting in the corner of one of the window seats behind a curtain. Aha! I thought, I've caught Smee. So I pulled the curtain to one side and touched a woman's arm. It was a dark, moonless night outside. I couldn't see the woman sitting in the corner of the window seat. Smee? I whispered. There was no answer. When Smee is challenged, he or she does not answer. So I sat down beside her to wait for the others. Then I whispered. What's your name? And out of the darkness beside me, the whisper came. Brenda Ford. I didn't know the name, but I guessed at once who she was. I knew every girl in the house by name except one, and that was the tall, pale, dark girl. So here she was, sitting beside me on the window seat. Shut in between a heavy curtain and a window. I was beginning to enjoy the game. I wondered if she was enjoying it too. I whispered one or two rather ordinary questions to her and received no answer. Smee is a game of silence. It's a rule of the game that Smee and the person or persons who have found Smee have to keep quiet. This, of course, makes it harder for the others to find them. But there was nobody else about. I wondered, therefore, why she was insisting on silence. I spoke again and got no answer. I began to feel a little annoyed. Perhaps she's one of those cold, clever girls who have a poor opinion of all men, I thought. She doesn't like me, and she's using the rules of the game as an excuse for not speaking. Well, if she doesn't like sitting here with me, I certainly don't want to sit with her. I turned away from her. I hope somebody finds us soon, I thought. As I sat there, I realized that I disliked sitting beside this girl very much indeed. That was strange. The girl I'd seen at dinner had seemed likable in a cold kind of way. I noticed her and wanted to know more about her. But now, I felt really uncomfortable beside her. The feeling of something wrong something unnatural, was growing. I remember touching her arm and I trembled with horror. I wanted to jump up and run away. I prayed that someone else would come along soon. Just then I heard light footsteps in the passage. Someone on the other side of the curtain brushed against my knees. The curtain moved to one side and a woman's hand touched my shoulder. It's me, 
whispered a voice that I recognised at once. It was Mrs Gorman. Of course she received no answer. She came and sat down beside me, and at once I felt very much better. It's Tony Jackson, isn't it? she whispered. Yes, I whispered back. You're not Smee, are you? No, she's on my other side. She reached out across me. I heard her fingernails scratch a woman's silk dress. Hello, Smee. How are you? Who are you? Oh, it's against the rules to talk. Never mind, Tony, we'll break the rules. Do you know, Tony, this game is beginning to annoy me a little. I hope they aren't going to play it all evening. I'd like to play a nice quiet game all together beside a warm fire. Me too, I agreed. Can't you suggest something to them? There's something rather unhealthy about this particular game. I'm sure I'm being very silly, but I can't get rid of the idea that we've got an extra player. Somebody who ought not to be here at all. That was exactly how I felt, but I didn't say so. However, I felt very much better. Mrs. Gorman's arrival had chased away my fears. We sat talking. I wonder when the others will find us, said Mrs. Gorman. After a time, we heard the sound of feet and young Reggie's voice shouting, Hello? Hello? Is anybody there? Yes, I answered. Is Mrs. Gorman with you? Yes. What happened to you? You've both got forfeits. We've been waiting for you for hours. But you haven't found Smee yet, I complained. You haven't, you mean. I was Smee this time. But Smee's here with us, I cried. Yes, agreed Mrs. Gorman. The curtain was pulled back and we sat looking into the eye of Reggie's electric torch. I looked at Mrs. Gorman and then on my other side, between me and the wall, was an empty place on the window seat. I stood up at once. Then I sat down again. I was feeling very sick and the world seemed to be going round and round. There was somebody here, I insisted, because I touched her. So did I, said Mrs. Gorman, in a trembling voice. And I don't think anyone could leave this window seat without us knowing. Reggie gave a shaky little laugh. I remembered his unpleasant experience earlier that evening. Someone's been playing jokes, he said. Are you coming down? We were not very popular when we came down to the sitting room. I found the two of them sitting behind a curtain on a window seat, said Reggie. I went up to the tall, dark girl. So you pretended to be Smee and then went away, I accused her. She shook her head. Afterwards we all played cards in the sitting room and I was very glad. Sometime later Jack Sangston wanted to talk to me. I could see that he was rather cross with me and soon he told me the reason. Tony, he said, I suppose you're in love with Mrs Gorman, that's your business. But please don't make love to her in my house during a game. You kept everyone waiting, it was very rude of you and I'm ashamed of you. But we weren't alone, I protested. There was somebody else there, someone who was pretending to be Smee. I believe it was that tall dark girl, Miss Ford. She whispered a name to me. Of course, she refused to admit it afterwards. Jack Sangston stared at me. Miss who? he breathed. Brenda Ford, she said. Jack put a hand on my shoulder. Look here, Tony, he said. I don't mind a joke, but enough is enough. We don't want to worry the ladies. Brenda Ford is the name of the girl who broke her neck on the stairs. She was playing hide-and-seek here ten years ago. Christmas Eve on a Haunted Hulk by Frank Cowper I shall never forget that night as long as I live. It was during the Christmas vacation of 1877. I was staying with an old college friend who had lately been appointed the curate of a country parish and had asked me to come and cheer him up since he could not get away at that time. As we drove along the straight country lane from the little wayside station, it forcibly struck me that life in such a place must be dreary indeed. I have always been much influenced by local colour. Above all things, I am depressed by a dead level, and here was monotony with a vengeance. On each side of the low hedges, lichen-covered and wind-cropped, stretched bare fields, the absolute level of the horizon being only broken at intervals by some mournful tree that pointed like a decrepit finger-post towards the east all its western growth was nipped and blasted by the roaring southwest winds. An occasional black spot, 
dotted against the grey distance marked a hayrick or labourer's cottage, while some two miles ahead of us the stunted spire of my friend's church stood out against the wintry sky amid the withered branches of a few ragged trees. On our right hand stretched dreary wastes of mud, interspersed here and there with firmer patches of land, but desolate and forlorn, cut off from all communication with the mainland by acres of mud and thin streaks of brown water. A few seabirds were piping over the waste, and this was the only sound, except the grit of our own wheels and the steady step of the horse, which broke the silence. Not lively, is it, said Jones, and I couldn't say it was. As we drove up street, as the inhabitants fondly call the small array of low houses which bordered the high road, I noticed the lacklustre expression of the few children and untidy women who were loitering about the doors of their houses. There was an old tumble-down inn with a dilapidated signboard, scarcely held up by its rickety ironwork. A daub of yellow and red paint with a dingy streak of blue was supposed to represent the Duke's head, although what exalted member of the aristocracy was thus distinguished, it would be hard to say. Jones inclined to think it was the Duke of Wellington, but I upheld the theory that it was the Duke of Marlborough, chiefly basing my arguments on the fact that no artist who desired to convey a striking likeness would fail to show the great duke in profile, whereas this personage was evidently depicted full face and wearing a three-cornered hat. At the end of the village was the church, standing in an untidy churchyard, and opposite it was a neat little house, quite new, and of that utilitarian order of architecture which will stamp the Victorian age as one of the least imaginative of eras. Two windows flanked the front door, and three narrow windows looked out overhead from under a slate roof, variety and distinction being given to the façade by the brilliant blending of the yellow bricks with red, so bright as to suggest the idea of their having been painted. A scrupulously clean stone at the front door, together with the bright green of the little palings and woodwork, told me what sort of landlady to expect, and I was not disappointed. A kindly-featured woman, thin, cheery and active, received us, speaking in that encouraging tone of half-compassionate, half-proprietary patronage, which I have observed so many women adopt towards lone beings of the opposite sex. You'll find it precious dull, old man, said Jones, as we were eating our frugal dinner. There's nothing for you to do unless you care to try a shot at the duck over the mud flats. I shall be busy on and off nearly all tomorrow. As we talked, I could not help admiring the cheerful pluck with which Jones endured the terrible monotony of his life in this dreary place. His rector was said to be delicate, and in order to prolong a life which no doubt he considered valuable to the church, he lived with his family either at Torquay or Cannes, in elegant idleness, quite unable to do any duty, but fully equal to enjoying the pleasant society of those charming places, and quite satisfied that he had done his duty when he sacrificed a tenth of his income to provide for the spiritual needs of his parish. There was no squire in the place, no gentlefolk, as the rustics called them, lived nearer than five miles, and there was not a single being of his own class with whom poor Jones could associate. And yet he made no complaint. The nearest approach to one being the remark that the worst of it was, it was so difficult, if not impossible, to be really understood. The poor being so suspicious and ignorant, they look at everything from such a low standpoint. Enthusiasm and freshness sink so easily into formalism, listlessness. The next day, finding that I really could be of no use and feeling awkward and bored, as a man always is when another is actively doing his duty, I went off to the marshes to see if I could get any sport. I took some sandwiches and a flask with me, not intending to return until dinner. After wandering about for some time, crossing dyke after dyke by treacherous rails, more or less rotten, I found myself on the edge of a wide mere. I could see some duck out in the middle, and standing far out in the shallow water was a heron. They were all out of shot, and I saw I should do no good without a duck punt. I sat down on an old pile left on top of the sea wall, which had been lately repaired. The duck looked very tempting, but I doubted if I should do much good in broad daylight, even if I had a duck punt without a duck gun. After sitting disconsolately for some time, I got up and wandered on. 
The dreariness of the scene was most depressing. Everything was brown and grey. Nothing broke the monotony of the wide-stretching mere. The whole scene gave me the impression of a straight line of interminable length, with a speck in the centre of it. That speck was myself. At last, as I turned an angle in the seawall, I saw something lying above high water mark, which looked like a boat. Rejoiced to see any signs of humanity, I quickened my pace. It was a boat, and better still, a duck punt. As I came nearer, I could see that she was old and very likely leaky. But here was a prospect of adventure, and I wasn't going to be readily daunted. On examination, the old craft seemed more watertight than I had expected. At least she held water very well, and if she kept it in, she must equally well keep it out. I turned her over to run the water out, and then, dragging the crazy old boat of the line of seaweed, launched her. But now a real difficulty met me. The paddles were nowhere to be seen. They had doubtless been taken away by the owner, and it would be little use searching for them. But a stout stick would do to punt her over the shallow water, and after some little search I found an old stake which would answer well. This was real luck. I had now some hope of bagging a few duck. At any rate, I was afloat and could explore the little islets which barely rose above the brown water. I might at least find some rabbits on them. I cautiously pulled myself towards the black dots, but before I came within range, up rose first one, then another and another like a string of beads, and the whole flight went, with outstretched necks and rapidly beating wings away to my right, and seemed to pitch again beyond the low island some half mile away. The heron had long ago taken himself off, so there was nothing to be done but pole across the mud in pursuit of the duck. I hadn't gone many yards when I found that I was going much faster than I expected, and soon saw the cause. The tide was falling, and I was being carried along with it. This would bring me nearer to my ducks, and I lazily guided the punt with the stake. On rounding the island, I found a new source of interest. The mere opened up to a much larger extent, and away towards my right I could see a break in the low land as if a wide ditch had been cut through while in this opening, ever and anon, dark objects rose up and disappeared again in a way I couldn't account for. The water seemed to be running off the mud flats, and I saw that if I didn't wish to be left high but not dry on the long, slimy wastes, I must be careful to keep in the little channels or lakes which acted as natural drains to the acres of greasy mud. A conspicuous object attracted my attention some mile or more towards the opening in the land, it was a vessel lying high up on the mud and looking as if she was abandoned. The ducks had pitched a hundred yards or so beyond the island, and I approached as cautiously as I could, but just as I was putting down the stake to take up my gun, there was a swift sound of beating wings and splashing water, and away my birds flew low over the mud towards the old hulk. Here was a chance, I thought, if I could get on board and remain hidden, I might, by patiently waiting, get a shot. I looked at my watch. There was still plenty of daylight left, and the tide was only just beginning to leave the mud. I punted away, therefore, with renewed hope, and was not long in getting up to the old ship. There was just sufficient water over the mud to allow me to approach within ten or twelve feet, but further I could not push the punt. This was disappointing. However, I noticed the deep lake ran round the other side and determined to try my luck there. So, with a slosh and a heave, I got the flat afloat again and made for the deeper water. It turned out quite successful, and I was enabled to get right under the square overhanging counter, while a little lane of water led alongside her starboard quarter. I pushed the nose of the punt into this and was not long in clambering on board by the rusty irons of her forechains. The old vessel lay nearly upright in the soft mud, and a glance soon told she would never be used again. The gear and rigging were all rotten, and everything valuable had been removed. She was a brig of some two hundred tons, and had been a fine vessel, no doubt. To me, there's always a world of romance in a deserted ship. The places she has been to, the scenes she has witnessed, the possibilities of crime, of adventure. All these thoughts crowd upon me when I see an old hulk lying deserted and forgotten, left to rot upon the mud of some lonely creek. In order to keep my punt afloat as long as possible, I towed her round and moored her under the stern, and then looked over the bulwarks for the duck. 
There they were, swimming not more than 150 yards away, and they were coming towards me. I remained perfectly concealed under the high bulwark and could see them paddling and feeding in the greasy weed. Their approach was slow, but I could afford to wait. Nearer and nearer they came, another minute, and they would be well within shot. I was already congratulating myself upon the success of my adventure and thinking of the joy of Jones at this large accession to his larder, when suddenly there was a heavy splash and a wild spluttering rush. The whole pack rose out of the water and went skimming over the mud toward the distant sea. I let off both barrels after them and tried to console myself by thinking I saw the feathers fly from one, but not a bird dropped and I was left alone in my chagrin. What could have caused the splash, the luckless splash, I wondered. There was surely no one else aboard the ship, and certainly no one could get out here without mud patterns or a boat. I looked round. All was perfectly still. Nothing broke the monotony of the grey scene, sodden, damp, and lifeless. A chill breeze came up from the southwest, bringing with it a raw mist, which was blotting out the dark distance and fast limiting my horizon. The day was drawing in and I must be thinking of going home. As I turned round, my attention was arrested by seeing a duck punt glide past me in a now rapidly falling water, which was swirling by the mud bank on which the vessel lay. But there was no one in her. A dreadful thought struck me. It must be my boat, and how shall I get home? I ran to the stern and looked over. The duck punt was gone. The frayed and stranded end of the paint had told me how it had happened. I had not allowed for the fall of the tide, and the strain of the punt as the water fell away had snapped the line, old and rotten as it was. I hurried to the bows, and jumping onto the bit, saw my punt peacefully drifting away some quarter of a mile off. It was perfectly evident. I could not hope to get to her again. It was beginning to rain steadily. I could see that I was in for a dirty weather, and became a little anxious about how I was to get back, especially as it was now rapidly growing dark. So thick was it that I couldn't see the low land anywhere and could only judge of its position by remembering that the stern of the vessel pointed that way. The conviction grew upon me that I could not possibly get away from this doleful old hulk without assistance, and how to get it I could not for the life of me see. I hadn't seen a sign of a human being the whole day. It was not likely any more would be about at night. However, I shouted as loud as I could and then waited to hear if there were any response. There was not a sound. Only the wind moaned slightly through the stumps of the masts and something creaked in the cabin. Well, I thought at least it might be worse. I shall have shelter for the night while, if I had been left on one of the islands, I should have had to spend the night exposed to the pelting rain. Happy thought. Go below before it gets too dark and see what sort of a berth can be got if the worst comes to the worst. So thinking, I went to the booby hatch and found, as I expected, it was half broken open, and anyone could go below who liked. As I stepped down the rotting companion, the air smelled foul and dank. I went below very cautiously, for I was not at all sure that the boards would bear me. It was fortunate I did so, for as I stepped off the lower step, the floor gave way under my foot, and had I not been holding on to the stair rail, I should have fallen through. Before going any further... I took a look around. The prospect was not inviting. The light was dim. I could scarcely make out objects near me. All else was obscurity. I could see that the whole of the inside of the vessel was completely gutted. What little light there was came through the stern ports. A small round speck of light looked at me out of the darkness ahead, and I could see that the flooring had either all given way or had been taken out of her. At my feet a gleam of water showed me what to expect, if I should slip through the floor joists, altogether a more desolate, gloomy, ghostly place, it would be difficult to find. I could not see any bunk or locker where I could sit down, and everything movable had been taken out of the hulk. Groping my way with increasing caution, I stepped across the joists and felt along the side of the cabin. I soon came to a bulkhead. Continuing to grope, I came to an opening. If the cabin was dim, here was blackness itself. I felt it would be useless to attempt to go further, especially as a very damp, foul odour came up from the bilge water in her hold. 
As I stood looking into the darkness, a creepy, chilly shudder passed over me, and with a shiver, turned round to look at the cabin. My eyes had now become used to the gloom. A deeper patch of darkness on my right suggested the possibility of a berth, and groping my way over to it, I found that the lower bulk was still entire. Here at least I could rest, if I found it impossible to get to shore. Having some wax vestas in my pocket, I struck a light and examined the bunk. It was better than I expected. If I could only find something to burn, I should be comparatively cheerful. Before reconciling myself to my uncomfortable position, I resolved to see whether I could not get to the shore and went up the rickety stairs again. It was raining hard and the wind had got up. Nothing could be more dismal. I looked over the side and lowered myself down from the main chains to see if it were possible to walk over the mud. I found I couldn't reach the mud at all, and fearful of being unable to climb back if I let go, I clambered up the side again and got on board. It was quite clear I must pass the night here. Before going below, I once more shouted at the top of my voice more to keep up my own spirits than with any hope of being heard, and then paused to listen. Not a sound of any sort replied. I now prepared to make myself as comfortable as I could. It was a dreary prospect. I would rather have spent the night on deck than down below in that foul cabin, but the drenching driving rain as well as the cold drove me to seek shelter below. It seemed so absurd to be in the position of a shipwrecked sailor within two or three miles of a prosy country hamlet and in a landlocked harbour while actually on land if the slimy deep mud could be called land. I had not many matches left, but I had my gun and cartridges. The idea occurred to me to fire off minute guns. That's what I ought to do, of course. The red flash will be seen in this dark night, for it was dark now and no mistake. Getting up onto the highest part of the vessel, I blazed away. The noise sounded to me deafening. Surely the whole countryside would be aroused. After firing off a dozen cartridges, I waited but the silence only seemed the more oppressive and the blackness all the darker. It's no good. I'll turn in, I thought dejectedly. With great difficulty, I groped my way to the top of the companion ladder and bumped dismally down the steps. If only I had a light, I should be fairly comfortable, I thought. Happy thought, make a spit devil, as we used to when boys call a little cone of damp gunpowder. I got out my last two cartridges and emptying the powder carefully into my hand, I moistened it and worked it up into a paste. I then placed it on the smooth end of the rail and lighted it. This was brilliant, at least so it seemed by contrast with the absolute darkness around me. By its light I was able to find my way to the bunk, and it lasted just long enough for me to arrange myself fairly comfortably for the night. By contriving a succession of matches, I was enabled to have enough light to see to eat my frugal supper for I had kept a little sherry and a few sandwiches to meet emergencies, and it was a fortunate thing I had. The light and the food made me feel more cheery, and by the time the last match had gone out, I felt worse might have happened to me by a long way. As I lay still, waiting for sleep to come, the absurdity of the situation forced itself upon me. Here was I, to all intents and purposes, as much cut off from all communication with the rest of the world as if I were cast away upon a desert island. The chances were that I should make someone see or hear me the next day. Jones would be certain to have the country searched, and that the longest I should only endure the discomfort of one night and get well laughed at for my pains. But meanwhile, I was absolutely severed from all human contact and was as isolated as Robinson Crusoe, only more so, for I had no other living thing whatever to share my solitude. The silence of the place was perfect, and if silence could woo sleep, sleep ought very soon to have come. But when one is hungry and wet, and in a strange, uncanny kind of place, besides being in one's clothes, it is a very difficult thing to go to sleep. First my head was too low, then, after resting it on my arms, I got cramp in them. My back seemed all over bumps when I turned on my side. I appeared to have got rather serious enlargement of the hip joint, and I found my damp clothes smelled very musty. After sighing and groaning for some time, I sat up for a change of position and nearly fractured my skull in so doing against the remains of what had once been a berth above me. I didn't dare to move in the inky blackness, for I had seen sufficient to know that I might easily break my leg or neck in the flawless cabin. 
There was nothing for it but to sit still or lie down and wait for daylight. I had no means of telling the time. When I had last looked at my watch before the last match had gone out, it was not more than six o'clock. It might now be about eight, or perhaps not so late. Fancy twelve long hours spent in that doleful black place with nothing in the world to do, pass away the time. I must go to sleep, and so, full of this resolve, I lay down again. I suppose I went to sleep. All I can recollect after lying down is keeping my mind resolutely turned inwards, as it were, and fixed upon the arduous business of counting an imaginary and interminable flock of sheep pass one by one through an ideal gate. This meritorious method of compelling sleep had, no doubt, been rewarded, but I have no means of knowing how long I slept, and I cannot tell at what hour of the night the following strange circumstances occurred, for occur. They certainly did. And I am as perfectly convinced that I was the oral witness to some ghastly crime as I am that I am writing these lines. I have little doubt I should be laughed at as Jones laughed at me, to be told that I was dreaming, that I was overtired and nervous. In fact, so accustomed have I become to this sort of thing that I now hardly ever tell my tale, or if I do, I put it in the third person. And then I find people believe it, or at least take much more interest in it. I suppose the reason is that people cannot bring themselves to think so strange a thing could have happened to such a prosy, everyday sort of man as myself, and they cannot divest their minds of the idea that I am, well, to put it mildly, drawing on my imagination for facts. Perhaps, if the tale appears in print, it will be believed, as a facetious friend of mine once said to a newly married couple who had just seen the announcement of their marriage in the Times. Ah! Didn't know you were married till you saw it in print. Well, be the time, or it may have been. All I know is that the next thing I can remember after getting my fifth hundred sheep through the gate is that I heard two most horrible yells ring through the darkness. I sat bolt upright, and as a proof that my senses were all there, I didn't bring my head this time against the berth overhead, remembering to bend it outward so as to clear it. There was not another sound. The silence was as absolute as the darkness. I must have been dreaming, I thought, but the sounds were ringing in my ears and my heart was beating with excitement. There must have been some reason for this. I never was taken this way before. I couldn't make it out and felt very uncomfortable. I sat there listening for some time, no other sound breaking the deathly stillness, and becoming tired of sitting, I lay down again. Once more I set myself to get my interminable flocks through that gate, but I couldn't help myself listening. There seemed to me a sound growing in the darkness, something gathering in the particles of the air as if molecules of the atmosphere were rustling together and with still movement were whispering something. The wind had died down, and I would have gone on deck if I could move, but it was hazardous enough moving about in the light. It would have been madness to attempt to move in that blackness, and so I lay still and tried to sleep. But now there was a sound indistinct, but no mere fancy, a muffled sound, as of some movement in the forepart of the ship. I listened intently, gazed into the darkness. What was the sound? It didn't seem like rats. It was a dull, shuffling kind of noise, very indistinct, and conveying no clue whatever as to its cause. It lasted only for a short time, but now the cold, damp air seemed to have become more piercingly chilly. The raw iciness seemed to strike into the very marrow of my bones and my teeth chattered. At the same time, a new sense seemed to be assailed. The foul odour, which I had noticed arising from the stagnant water in the bilge, appeared to rise into more objectionable prominence, as if it had been stirred. I can't stand this, I muttered, shivering in horrible aversion at the disgusting odour. I'll go on deck at all hazards. Rising to put this resolve into execution, I was arrested by the noise beginning again. I listened. This time, I distinctly distinguished two separate sounds. One, like a heavy soft weight being dragged along with difficulty. The other, like the hard sound of boots on boards. Could there be others on board after all? If so, why had they made no sound when I clambered on deck or afterwards when I shouted and fired my gun? Clearly, if there were people, they wished to remain concealed, and my presence was inconvenient to them. But how absolutely still and quiet they had kept. It appeared incredible 
there should be anyone. I listened intently. The sound had ceased again, and once more the most absolute stillness reigned around. A gentle swishing, wobbling, lapping noise seemed to form itself in the darkness. It increased until I recognized the chattering and bubbling of water. It must be the tide rising, I thought. It's reached the rudder and is eddying around the stern post. This also accounted in my mind for the other noises because, as the tide surrounded the vessel and she thus became waterborne, all kinds of sounds might be produced in the old hulk as she resumed her upright position. However, I couldn't get rid of the chilly, horrid feeling those two screams had produced, combined with the disgusting smell which was getting more and more obtrusive. It was foul, horrible, revolting, like some carrion, putrid and noxious. I prepared to take my chances of damage and rose up to grope my way to the companion ladder. It was a more difficult job than I had any idea of. I had my gun, it was true, and with it I could feel for the joists, but once I let go of the edge of the bunk, I had nothing to steady me and nearly went headlong at the first step. Fortunately, I reached back in time to prevent my fall, but this attempt convinced me that I had better endure the strange horrors of the unknown and the certain miseries of a broken leg or neck. I sat down, therefore, on the bunk. Now that my own movements had ceased, I became aware that the shuffling noise was going on all the time. Well, thought I, they may shuffle, they won't hurt me, and I shall go to sleep again. So reflecting, I lay down, holding my gun, ready to use it as a club, if necessary. Now, it's all very well to laugh at superstitious terrors. Nothing is easier than to obtain a cheap reputation for brilliancy independence of thought and courage by deriding the fear of the supernatural when comfortably seated in a drawing room well lighted with company but put those scoffers in a like situation with mine and i don't believe they would have been any more free from a feeling the reverse of bold mocking and comfortable than i was i had read that most powerful ghost story the haunted and the haunters by the late lord lytton and the vividness of that weird tale had always impressed me greatly was I actually now to experience in my own person, and with no possibility of escape, the trying ordeal that bold ghost hunter went through under much more favourable circumstances? He at least had his servant with him. He had fuel and a light, and above all, he could get away when he wanted to. I felt I could face any number of spiritual manifestations if only I had warmth and light. But the icy coldness of the air was eating to my bones, and I shivered. Till my teeth chattered. I couldn't get to sleep. I couldn't prevent myself listening. And at last I gave up the contest and let myself listen. But there seemed now nothing to listen to. All the time I had been refusing to let my ears do their office by putting my handkerchief over one ear and lying on my arm with the other. A confused noise appeared to reach me, but the moment I turned round and lay on my back, everything seemed quiet. It's only my fancy after all result of cold and want of a good dinner, I'll go to sleep. But in spite of this, I lay still, listening a little longer. There was a sound of trickling water against the broad bilge of the old hulk, and I knew the tide was rising fast. My thoughts turned to the lost canoe, to reproaching myself with my stupidity in not allowing enough rope or looking at it more carefully. Suddenly, I became all attention again. An entirely different sound now arrested me. It was distinctly a low groan, followed almost immediately by heavy blows, blows which fell upon a soft substance, and then more groans, and again those sickening blows. There must be men here. Where are they? And what is it? I sat up and strained my eyes towards where the sound came from. The sounds had ceased again. Should I call out and let the man or men know that I was here? What puzzled me was the absolute darkness. How could anyone see to hit an object or do anything else in this dense obscurity? It appalled me. Anything might pass an inch's distance, and I couldn't tell who or what it was. But how could anything human find its way about any more than I could? Perhaps there was a solid bulkhead dividing the forecastle from me, but it would have to be very sound and with no chink whatever to prevent a gleam or ray of light finding its way out somewhere. I couldn't help feeling convinced the whole hull was open from one end to the other. Was I really dreaming after all? To convince myself that I was wide awake, I felt in my pockets of my notebook, 
Pulling out my pencil, I opened the book and, holding it in my left hand, wrote as well as I could, I feel alone. I am wide awake. It is about midnight, Christmas Eve, 1877. I found I had got to the bottom of the page, so I shut the book up, resolving to look at it the next morning. I felt curious to see what the writing looked like by daylight. But all further speculation was cut short by the shuffling and dragging noise beginning again. There was no doubt the sounds were louder, were coming my way. I never in all my life felt so uncomfortable. I may as well at once confess it, so frightened. There, in that empty hull over that boardless floor over those rotting joists, somebody or something was dragging some heavy weight. What I could not imagine, only the shrieks, the blows, the groans, the dull thumping sounds compelled me to suspect the worst, to feel convinced that I was actually within some few feet of a horrible murder then being committed. That I actually heard the sounds, I had no doubt. That they were growing louder and more distinct, I felt painfully aware. The horror of the situation was intense. If only I could strike a light and see what was passing close there, but I had no matches. I could hear a sound as of someone breathing slowly, stertorously, and a dull groan. And once more the cruel sodden blows fell again, followed by a drip, drip, and heavy drop in the dank water below, from which the sickening smell rose, pungent, reeking, horrible. The dragging, shuffling noise now began again. It came quite close to me, so close, that I felt I had only to put out my hand to touch it, the thing. Good heavens, was it coming to my bunk? The thing passed, and all the time the dull drip, as if some heavy drops fell into the water below. It was awful. All this time I was sitting up and holding my gun by its barrel, ready to use it if I were attacked. As the sound passed me at the closest, I put out the gun involuntarily, but it touched nothing, and I shuddered at the thought that there was no floor over which the weight could be drawn. I must be dreaming some terribly vivid dream. It couldn't be real. I pinched myself. I felt I was pinching myself. It was no dream. The sweat poured off my brow. My teeth chattered with the cold. It was terrific in its dreadful mystery. And now the sounds altered. The noises had reached the companion ladder. Something was climbing them with difficulty. The old stairs creaked, thump, thump. The thing was dragged up the steps with many pauses. And at last it seemed to have reached the deck. A long pause now followed. The silence grew dense around. I dreaded the stillness, the silence, that made itself be heard almost more than the sounds. What new horror would that awful quiet bring forth? What terror was still brooding in the depths of that clinging darkness, darkness that could be felt? The absolute silence was broken, horribly broken, by a dull drip from the stairs, and then dragging began again, distant less distinct, but the steps were louder. They came nearer over my head. The old boards creaked, and the weight was dragged right over me. I could hear it above my head, for the steps stopped, and two distinct raps, followed by a third heavier one, sounded so clearly above me that it seemed almost as if it was something striking the rotten woodwork of the berth over my head. The sounds were horribly suggestive of the elbows and head, a body being dropped on the deck. And now, as if the horrors had not been enough, a fresh ghastliness was added. So close were the raps above me that I involuntarily moved, as if I had been struck by what caused them. As I did so, I felt something drop onto my head and slowly trickle over my forehead. It was too horrible. I sprang up in my disgust, and with a wild cry, I stepped forward and instantly fell between the joists into the rank water below. The shock was acute. Had I been asleep and dreaming before, this must inevitably have roused me up. I found myself completely immersed in water, and for a moment was absolutely incapable of thinking. As it was pitch dark and my head had gone under, I couldn't tell whether I was above water or not. As I felt the bottom and struggled and splashed onto my legs, it was only by degrees I knew I must be standing with my head out of the foul mixture because I was able to breathe easily, although the wet running down from my hair dribbled into my mouth as I stood shivering and gasping. It was astonishing how a physical discomfort overcame a mental terror. Nothing could be more miserable than my present position, and my efforts were at once directed to getting out of this dreadful place. But let anyone who has ever had the ill luck to fall out of bed in his boyhood try and recollect his sensations. 
the bewildering realization that he is not in bed, that he does not know where he is, which way to go, or what to do to get back again. Everything he touches seems strange, and one piece of furniture much the same as any other. I well remembered such an accident, and how, having rolled under the bed before I was wide awake, I couldn't for the life of me understand why I couldn't get up, what it was that kept me down. I had not the least idea which way to get out, and kept going round and round in a circle under my bed for a long time, and should probably have been doing it until daylight, had not my sighs and groans awoken my brother, who slept in the same room that came to my help. If, then, one is so utterly at fault in a room every inch of which one knows intimately, how much more hopeless was my position at the bottom of this old vessel, half immersed in water, and totally without any clue which would help me get out. I had not the least idea which was the ship's stern or which her stem, and every moment I made with my feet only served to unsteady me, as the bottom was all covered with slime and uneven with the great timbers of the vessel. My first thought on recovering my wits was to stretch my arms up over my head, and I was relieved to find I could easily reach the joists above me. I was always fairly good at gymnastics, and had not much difficulty in drawing myself up and sitting on the joist, although the weight of my wet clothes added to my exertions considerably. Having so far succeeded, I sat and drained, as it were, into the water below. The smell was abominable. I never disliked myself so much, and I shivered with cold. As I could not get any wetter, I determined to go on deck somehow. But where was the companion ladder? I had nothing to guide me. Strange to say, the reality of my struggles had almost made me forget the mysterious phenomena I had been listening to. But now, as I looked round, my attention was caught by a luminous patch which quivered and flickered on my right. At what distance from me, I couldn't tell. It was like the light from a glowworm, only larger and changing in shape sometimes elongated like a lambent oval, and then it would sway one way or another, as if caught in a draught of air. When I was looking at it, and wondering what could cause it, I heard the steps above my head. They passed over me, and then seemed to grow louder on my left. Creeping dread again came over me. If only I could get out of this horrible place, but where were the stairs? I listened. The footfall seemed to be coming down some steps. Then, companion ladder must be on my left, but if I moved that way I should meet the thing, whatever it was, that was coming down. I shuddered at the thought. However, I made up my mind. Stretching up my hand very carefully, I felt for the next joist, reached it and crawled across. I stopped to listen. The steps were coming nearer. My hearing had now become acute. I could almost tell the exact place of each footfall. It came closer, closer, quite close, surely on the very joist on which I was sitting. I thought I could feel the joist quiver and voluntarily move my hand to prevent the heavy tread falling on it. The steps passed on, grew fainter and ceased as they drew near the pale lamp of light. One thing I noticed with curious horror, and that was that although the thing must have passed between me and the light, yet it was never for a moment obscured, which it must have been that any body or substance passed between yet I was certain that the steps went directly from me to it. It was all horribly mysterious, and what had become of the other sound, the thing that was being dragged? An irresistible shudder passed over me, but I determined to pursue my way until I came to something. It would never do to sit still and shiver there. After many narrow escapes of falling again, I reached a bulkhead, and cautiously feeling along it I came to an opening. It was the companion ladder, by this time my hands, by feeling of the joists, had become dry again. I felt along the step to be quite sure that it was the stairs, and in doing so I touched something wet, sticky, clammy. Oh, horror, what was it? A cold shiver shook me nearly off the joist, and I felt an unutterable sense of repulsion to going on. However, the fresher air which came down the companion revived me, and conquering my dread, I clambered onto the step. It didn't take long to get upstairs and stand on the deck again. I think I have never in all my life experienced such a sense of joy as I did on being out of that disgusting hole. It was true I was soaking wet, and the night wind cut through me like a knife, but these were things I could understand, and were a matter of common experience. What I had gone through might only be a question of nerves and had no tangible or visible terror 
but it was nonetheless very dreadful, and I would not go through such an experience again for words. As I stood cowering under the lee of the bulwark, I looked round at the sky. There was a pale light, as if of daybreak, away in the east, and it seemed as if all my troubles would be over with the dawn. It was bitterly cold. The wind had got round to the north, and I could faintly make out a low shore astern. While I stood shivering there, a cry came down the wind. At first I thought it was a seabird, but it sounded again. I felt sure it was a human voice. I sprang up on the taffrail and shouted at the top of my lungs, then paused. The cry came down clearer and distinct. It was Jones's voice. Had he heard me? I waved my draggled pocket handkerchief and shouted again. In the silence which followed, I caught the words, We're coming! What joyful words! Never did shipwrecked mariner on a lonely isle feel great delight. My misery would soon be over. Anyhow, I should not have to wait long. Unfortunately, the tide was low and still falling. Nothing but a boat could reach me, I thought, and to get a boat would take some time. I therefore stamped up and down on the deck to get warm, but I had an instinctive aversion for the companion ladder and the deep shadows of the forepart of the vessel. As I turned around in my walk, I thought I saw something moving over the mud. I stopped. It was undoubtedly a figure coming towards me. A voice hailed me in gruff accents. Billy Oi! Be anyone aboard? Was anyone aboard? What an absurd question. Here had I been shouting myself hoarse. However, I quickly reassured him, and then understand why my rescuer did not sink in the soft mud. He had mud patterns on. Coming up as close as he could, he shouted to me to keep clear, and then threw first one, then the other, clattering wooden board onto the deck. I found them, and under the instructions of my friend, I didn't take long in putting them on. The man was giving me directions as how to manage, but I didn't care how much wetter I got, and dropped over the side into the slime. Sliding and straddling, I managed to get to my friend, and then together we skated, as it were, to the shore, although skating very little represents the awkward splashes and slips I made on my way to land. I found quite a little crowd awaiting me on the bank, but Jones, with ready consideration, hurried me off to a cart he had in a lane near, and drove me home. I told him the chief points of the adventure on our way, but didn't say anything of the curious noises. It's odd how shy a man feels at telling what he knows people will never believe. It was not until the evening of the next day that I began to tell him, and then only after I was fortified by an excellent dinner and some very good claret. Jones listened attentively. He was far too kindly and well-bred to laugh at me, but I could see he didn't believe one word as to the reality of the occurrence. Very strange. How remarkable. Quite extraordinary, he kept saying, with evident interest. But I was sure he put it all down to my fatigue and disordered imagination, and so to do him justice as everybody else to whom I've told the tale since. The fact is, we cannot in this prosaic age believe in anything the least approaching the supernatural, nor do I. But nevertheless, I am as certain as I am that I'm writing these words that the thing did really happen and will happen again. May happen every night for all I know, only I don't intend to try and put my belief to the test. I have a theory which of course will be laughed at, and as I'm not in the least scientific, I cannot bolster it up by scientific arguments. It is this, as Mr. Edison has now discovered by certain simple processes, human sounds can be reproduced at any future date, so accidentally and owing to the combination of most curious coincidences, it might happen that the agonized cries of some suffering being, or the sounds made by one at a time when all other emotions are as nothing compared to the supreme sensations of one committing some awful crime, could be impressed on the atmosphere or surface of an enclosed building, which could be reproduced by a current of air passing into that building under the same atmospheric conditions. This is the vague explanation I've given myself. However, be the explanation what it may be, the facts are as I have stated them. Let those laugh who did not experience them. To return to the end of the story, there were two things I pointed out to Jones as conclusive that I wasn't dreaming. One was my pocketbook. I showed it to him, and the words were quite clear, only of course very straggling. This is a facsimile of the writing, but I cannot account for the date being 1837. I am wide awake. It is Christmas Eve, 1837. The other point was the horrible stains on my hands and clothes. 
A foul-smelling dark chocolate stain was on my hair, hands and clothes. Jones said, of course, this was from the rust of the mouldering ironwork, some of which had no doubt trickled down, owing to the heavy rain, through the defective corking of the deck. The fact is, there is nothing that an ingenious mind can't explain. But the question is, is the explanation the right one? I could easily account for the phosphorescent blight. The water was foul and stagnant, and it was no doubt caused by the same gases which produced the well-known ignis fatus, or will-o'-the-wisp. We visited the ship, and I recovered my gun. There were the same stains on deck as there were on my clothes, and, curiously enough, they went in a nearly straight line over the place where I lay, from the top of the companion to the starboard bulwark. We carefully examined the forepart of the ship, it was as completely gutted as the rest of her. Jones was glad to get on deck again as the atmosphere was very unpleasant, and I had no wish to stay. At my request, Jones made every inquiry he could about the old hulk. Not much was elicited. So far it looked as if it were credited with being haunted. The owner, who had been the captain of her, had died about three years before. His character did not seem amiable. But as he had left his money to the most influential farmer in the district, the country people were unwilling to talk against him. I went with Jones to call on the farmer and asked him point blank if he had ever heard whether a murder had been committed on board the Lily. He stared at me and they laughed. Not as I know of, was all his answer, and I never got any nearer than that. I feel that this is all very unsatisfactory. I wish I could give some thrilling and sensational explanation. I'm sorry I cannot. My imagination suggests many, as no doubt it will to each of my readers who possesses that faculty, but I have only written this to tell the actual facts, not to add to our superabundant fiction. If I ever come across any details bearing upon the subject, I will not fail to communicate them at once. The vessel I found was the Lily of Ghoul, owned by one master Gad Earwaker, and built in 1801. The Old Portrait by Hume Nesbitt Old-fashioned frames are a hobby of mine. I'm always on the prowl amongst the frames and dealers and curiosities for something quaint and unique in picture frames. I don't care much for what's inside them. For being a painter, it is my fancy to get the frames first and then paint a picture which I think suits their probable history and design. In this way, I get some curious and I think also some original ideas. One day in December, about a week before Christmas, I picked up a fine but dilapidated specimen of wood carving in a shop near Soho. The gilding had been worn nearly away and three of the corners broken off, yet, as there was one of the corners still left, I hoped to be able to repair the others from it. As for the canvas inside this frame, it was so smothered with dirt and time stains that I could only distinguish it had been a very badly painted likeness of some sort, of some commonplace person daubed in by a poor pot-boiling painter to fill the second-hand frame, which his patron may have picked up cheaply, as I had done after him. But as the frame was all right, I took the spoiled canvas along with it, thinking it might come in handy. For the next few days my hands were full of work of one kind and another, so that it was only on Christmas Eve that I found myself at liberty to examine my purchase which had been lying with its face to the wall since I had brought it to my studio. Having nothing to do on this night and not in the mood to go out, I got my picture and frame from the corner and laying them upon the table with a sponge, basin of water and some soap, I began to wash so that I might see them the better. They were in a terrible mess and I think I used the best part of a packet of soap powder and had to change the water about a dozen times before the pattern began to show up on the frame and the portrait within it asserted its awful crudeness vile drawing and intense vulgarity. It was a bloated, piggish visage of a publican, clearly, with a plentiful supply of jewellery displayed, as is usual with such masterpieces, where the features are not considered of so much importance as a strict fidelity in the depicting of such articles as watchguard and seals, fingerings and breastpins. These were all there, 
as natural and hard as reality. The frame delighted me and the picture satisfied me that I had not cheated the dealer with my price. And I was looking at the monstrosity as the gaslight beat full upon it and wondering how the owner could be pleased with himself as thus depicted. When something about the background attracted my attention, a slight marking underneath the thin coating as if the portrait had been painted over some other subject. It was not much, certainly, yet enough to make me rush over to my cupboard where I kept my spirits of wine and turpentine, with which, and a plentiful supply of rags, I began to demolish the publican ruthlessly in the vague hope that I might find something worth looking at underneath. A slow process that was, as well as a delicate one, so that it was close upon midnight before the gold cable rings and vermilion visage disappeared, and another picture loomed up before me. Then, giving it the final wash over, I wiped it dry and set it in a good light at my easel, while I filled and lit my pipe and then sat down to look at it. What had I liberated from that vile prison of crude paint? For I did not require to set it up to know that this bungler of the brush had covered and defiled a work as far beyond his comprehension as the clouds are from the caterpillar. The bust and head of a young woman of uncertain age merged with the gloom of rich accessories, painted as only a master hand can paint, who is above asserting his knowledge, and who has learned to cover his technique. It was as perfect and natural in sombre yet quiet dignity as if it had come from the brush of Moroni. The face and neck perfectly colourless in their pallid whiteness, and the shadows so artfully managed that they could not be seen, and for this quality would have delighted the strong-minded Queen Bess. At first, as I looked, I saw in the centre of a vague darkness a dim patch of grey gloom that drifted into the shadow. Then the greyness appeared to grow lighter as I sat from it, and I leaned back in my chair until the features stole out softly and became clear and definite, while the figure stood out from the background as if tangible, although, having washed it, I knew that it had been smoothly painted. An intent face, with delicate nose, well-shaped, although bloodless, lips and eyes like dark caverns without a spark of light in them, the hair loosely about the head and oval cheeks massive, silky textured, jet black and lustreless, which hid the upper portion of her brow with the ears and fell in straight indefinite waves over the left breast, leaving the right portion of the transparent neck exposed. The dress and background were symphonies of ebony, yet full of subtle colouring and masterly feeling, a dress of rich brocaded velvet with a background that represented vast receding space, wondrously suggestive and awe-inspiring. I noticed that the pallid lips were parted slightly and showed a glimpse of the upper front teeth, which added to the intent expression of the face, a short upper lip which curled upward, with the underlip full and sensuous, or rather, if colour had been in it, would have been so. It was an eerie-looking face that I had resurrected on this midnight hour of Christmas Eve, in its passive pallidity, it looked as if the blood had been drained from the body, that I was gazing upon an open-eyed corpse. The frame also I noticed for the first time in its details appeared to have been designed with the intention of carrying out the idea of life in death. What had before looked like scrollwork of flowers and fruit were loathsome snake-like worms twined amongst charnel house bones, which they half covered in a decorative fashion. A hideous design in spite of its exquisite workmanship. That made me shudder and wish that I had left the cleaning to be done by daylight. I am not at all of a nervous temperament, and would have laughed had anyone told me that I was afraid, and yet, as I sat here alone, with that portrait opposite to me in this solitary studio, away from all human contact, for none of the other studios were tenanted on this night, and the janitor had gone on his holiday, I wished that I had spent my evening in a more congenial manner, for, in spite of a good fire in the stove and the brilliant gas, that intent face and those haunting eyes were exercising a strange influence upon me. I heard the clocks from the different steeples chime out the last hour of the day, one after the other like echoes taking up the refrain and dying away in the distance. And still, I sat spellbound, looking at that weird picture with my neglected pipe in my hand and a strange lassitude creeping over me. 
It was the eyes which fixed me now with the unfathomable depths and absorbing intensity. They gave out no light, but seemed to draw my soul into them, and with it my life and strength as I lay inert before them, until overpowered, I lost consciousness and dreamt. I thought that the frame was still on the easel with the canvas, but the woman had stepped from them and was approaching me with a floating motion, leaving behind her a vault filled with coffins, some of them shut down, while others lay or stood upright and open, showing the grisly contents in their decaying and stained cerements. I could only see her head and shoulders with the sombre drapery of the upper portion and the inky wealth of hair hanging around. She was with me now, that pallid face touching my face and those cold, bloodless lips glued to mine with a close, lingering kiss, while the soft black hair covered me like a cloud and thrilled me through and through with a delicious thrill that, whilst it made me grow faint, intoxicated me with delight. As I breathed, she seemed to absorb it quickly into herself, giving me back nothing, getting stronger as I was becoming weaker, while the warmth of my contact passed into her and made her palpitate with vitality. And all at once the horror of approaching death seized upon me, and with a frantic effort I flung her from me and started up from my chair, dazed for a moment and uncertain where I was. Then consciousness returned, and I looked around wildly. The gas was still blazing brightly, while the fire burned ruddy in the stove. By the timepiece on the mantel, I could see that it was half past twelve. The picture and the frame were still on the easel, only as I looked at them, the portrait had changed. A hectic flush was on the cheeks, while the eyes glittered with life, and the sensuous lips were red and ripe-looking, with a drop of blood still upon the nether one. In a frenzy of horror, I seized my scraping knife and slashed out the vampire picture. Then, tearing the mutilated fragments out, I crammed them into my stove and watched them frizzle with savage delight. I have that frame still, but I have not yet had courage to paint a suitable subject for it. Jerry Bundler by W. W. Jacobs It wanted a few nights to Christmas, a festival for which the small market town of Torchester was making extensive preparations. The narrow streets which had been thronged with people were now almost deserted. The cheap Jack from London, with the remnant of breath left in him after his evening's exertions, was making feeble attempts to blow out his naphtha lamp, and the last shops open were rapidly closing for the night. In the comfortable coffee room of the old boar's head, half a dozen guests, principally commercial travellers, sat talking by the light of the fire. The talk had drifted from trade to politics, from politics to religion, and so by easy stages, to the supernatural. Three ghost stories never known to fail before had fallen flat. There was too much noise outside, too much light within. The fourth story was told by an old hand with more success. The streets were quiet, and he had turned the gas out. In the flickering light of the fire, as it shone on the glasses and danced with shadows on the walls, the story proved so enthralling that George, the waiter, whose presence had been forgotten, created a very disagreeable sensation by suddenly starting up from a dark corner and gliding silently from the room. "'That's what I call a good story,' said one of the men, sipping his hot whisky. "'Of course, it's an old idea that spirits like to get into the company of human beings. A man told me once that he travelled down the Great Western with a ghost.' and hadn't the slightest suspicion of it until the inspector came for the tickets. My friend said the way that the ghost tried to keep up appearances by feeling for it in all its pockets and looking on the floor it was quite touching. Ultimately, it gave up and, with a faint groan, vanished through the ventilator. 
"'That'll do, Hurst,' said another man. "'It's not a subject for jesting,' said a little old gentleman who had been an attentive listener. "'I've never seen an apparition myself, but I know people who have, "'and I consider that they form a very interesting link between us and the afterlife. "'There's a ghost story connected with this house, you know.' "'Never heard of it,' said another speaker, "'and I've been here some years now.' "'It dates back a long time now,' said the old gentleman. "'You've heard about Jerry Bundler, George?' "'Well, I've just heard odds and ends, sir,' said the old waiter. "'But I never put much count on him. "'There was one chap here what said he saw it, "'and the governor sacked him prompt. "'My father was a native of this town,' said the old gentleman, "'and knew the story well. "'He was a truthful man and a steady churchgoer, "'but I've heard him declare that once in his life "'he saw the appearance of Jerry Bungler in this house.' Uh, "'And who was this Jerry Bundler?' inquired a voice. "'A London thief, a pickpocket, a highwayman, "'anything he could turn his dishonest hand to,' replied the old gentleman. "'And he was run to earth, in this house, one Christmas week, some eighty years ago. "'He took his last supper in this very room, "'and after he had gone up to bed, a couple of Bow Street runners, "'who had followed him from London, but lost the scent a bit, went upstairs with the landlord and tried the door. It was stout oak and fast, so one went into the yard and by means of a short ladder got onto the window sill, while the other stayed outside the door. Those below in the yard saw the man crouching on the sill, and then there was a sudden smash of glass, and with a cry he fell in a heap on the stones at their feet. Then, in the moonlight, they saw the white face of the pickpocket peeping over the sill, and while some stayed in the yard, others ran into the house and helped the other man to break the door in. It was difficult to obtain an entrance even then, for it was barred with heavy furniture. But they got in at last, and the first thing that met their eyes was the body of Jerry dangling from the top of the bed by his own handkerchief. "'Which bedroom was it?' asked two or three voices together. "'The narrator shook his head. "'That I can't tell you. "'But the story goes that Jerry still haunts his house, "'and my father used to declare positively "'that the last time he slept here, "'the ghost of Jerry Bundler lowered itself from the top of his bed "'and tried to strangle him. "'That'll do,' said an uneasy voice. "'I wish you'd thought to ask your father which bedroom it was.' "'What for?' inquired the old gentleman. "'Well, I, I should take care not to sleep in it, that's all,' said the voice shortly. "'There's nothing to fear,' said the other. "'I don't believe for a moment that ghosts could really hurt one. "'In fact, my father used to confess that it was only the unpleasantness of the thing that upset him, "'and that for all practical purposes, Jerry's fingers might have been made of cotton wool.' all the harm they could do. "'That's all very fine,' said the last speaker again. "'A ghost story is a ghost story, sir. "'But when a gentleman tells a tale of a ghost "'in the house in which one is going to sleep, "'I call it most ungentlemanly.' "'Puff! Nonsense,' said the old gentleman, rising. "'Ghosts can't hurt you. "'For my own part, I should rather like to see one. "'Good night, gentlemen.' "'Good night,' said the others. "'And I only hope Jerry will pay you a visit,' added the nervous man as the door closed. "'Bring some more whisky, George,' said a stout commercial. "'I want keeping up when the talk turns this way.' "'Shall I light the gas, Mr. Malcolm?' said George. "'No, the fire's very comfortable,' said the traveller. "'Now, gentlemen, any of you know any more?' "'I think we've had enough,' said another man. "'We shall be thinking we see spirits next, "'and we're not at all like the old gentleman who's just gone.' "'Old humbug,' said Hurst. "'I should like to put him to the test. "'Suppose I dress up as Jerry Bundler "'and go and give him a chance of displaying his courage.' "'Bravo!' said Malcolm huskily, "'drowning one or two faint no's. "'Just for the joke, gentlemen.' "'No, no, drop it, Hurst,' said another man. "'Only for the joke,' said Hurst, somewhat eagerly. "'I've got some things upstairs "'in which I'm going to play in the rivals, "'knee breeches, buckles.' 
and all that sort of thing. It's a rare chance. If you wait a bit, I'll give you a full dress rehearsal entitled Jerry Bundler or The Nocturnal Strangler. You won't frighten us, said the commercial with a husky laugh. I don't know that, said Hurst sharply. It's a question of acting, that's all. I'm pretty good, ain't I, Summers? Oh, you're all right, for an amateur, said his friend with a laugh. I'll bet you a level sov. You don't frighten me, said the stout traveller. Done, said Hurst. I'll take the bet to frighten you first and the old gentleman afterwards. These gentlemen shall be the judges. You won't frighten us, sir, said another man, because we're prepared for you. But you'd better leave the old man alone. It's dangerous play. Well, I'll try you first, said Hurst, springing up. No gas, mind. He ran lightly upstairs to his room, leaving the others, most of whom had been drinking somewhat freely, to wrangle about the proceedings. It ended in two of them going to bed. He's crazy on acting, said Summers, lighting his pipe. Thinks he's the equal of anybody, almost. It doesn't matter with us, but I won't let him go to the old man. And he won't mind, as long as he gets an opportunity of acting to us. Well, I hope he'll hurry up, said Malcolm, yawning. It's after twelve now. Nearly half an hour passed. Malcolm drew his watch from his pocket and was busy winding it when George, the waiter, who had been sent on an errand to the bar, burst suddenly into the room and rushed towards them. He's coming, gentlemen, he said breathlessly. Why, you're frightened, George, said the stout commercial with a chuckle. It was the suddenness of it, said George sheepishly. And besides, I didn't look for seeing him in the bar. There's only a glimmer of light there, and he was sitting on the floor behind the bar. I nearly trod on him. Oh, you'll never make a man, George, said Malcolm. Well, he took me unaware, said the waiter. Not that I'd have gone to the bar by myself, if I'd known he was there. And I don't believe you would either, sir. Nonsense, said Malcolm. I'll go and fetch him in. You don't know what it's like, sir, said George, catching him by the sleeve. It ain't fit to look at by yourself. It ain't. Indeed, it's got the... What's that? They all started at the sound of a smothered cry from the staircase and the sound of somebody running hurriedly along the passage. Before anybody could speak, the door flew open and a figure bursting into the room flung itself, gasping and shivering upon them. "'What is it? What's the matter?' demanded Malcolm. "'Why, it's Mr. Hurst!' He shook him roughly, and then held some spirit to his lips. Hurst drank it greedily, and with a sharp intake of his breath, gripped him by the arm. "'Light the gas, George,' said Malcolm. The waiter obeyed hastily. Hurst, a ludicrous but pitiable figure, in knee breeches and coat, a large rig all awry, and his face a mess of grease paint, clung to him, trembling. "'Now what's the matter?' asked Malcolm. "'I've seen it,' said Hurst with a historical sob. "'Oh, Lord, I'll never play the fool again. Never!' S "'Seen what?' said the others. "'Him! It! The ghost! Anything!' said Hurst wildly. "'Rot!' said Malcolm uneasily. "'I was coming down the stairs,' said Hurst, just capering down, as I thought it ought to do. I, I felt a tap.' He broke off suddenly and peered nervously through the open door into the passage. I thought I saw it again, he whispered. Look, at the foot of the stairs, can you see anything? No, there's nothing there, said Malcolm, whose own voice shook a little. Go on, you felt a tap on your shoulder. I turned round and saw it, a little wicked head and a white, dead face. Ah, that's what I saw in the bar, said George. Horrid it was, devilish. Hurst shuddered and was still retaining his nervous grip of Malcolm's sleeve dropped into a chair. "'Well, it's a most unaccountable thing,' said the dumbfounded Malcolm, turning round to the others. "'It's the last time I come to this house.' "'I'll leave tomorrow,' said George. "'I wouldn't go down in that bar again by myself. No, not for fifty pan.' "'It's talking about the thing that's caused it, I expect,' said one of the men. "'We've all been talking about this and, and having it in our minds. Practically, we've been forming a spiritualistic circle without knowing it.' "'Hang the old gentleman,' said Malcolm heartily. "'Pon my soul, I'm half afraid to go to bed. "'It's odd they should both think they saw something.' "'I saw it as plain as I'll see you, sir,' said George solemnly. "'Perhaps if you keep your eyes turned up the passage, you'll see it for yourself.' "'They followed the direction of his finger, but saw nothing. 
although one of them fancied that a head peeped round the corner of the wall. "'We'll come down to the bar,' said Malcolm, looking round. "'You can go if you like,' said one of the others with a faint laugh. Uh, "'We'll wait here for you.' The stout traveller walked towards the door and took a few steps up the passage. Then he stopped. All was silent, and he walked slowly to the end and looked down fearfully towards the glass partition which shut off the bar. Three times he made as though to go to it. Then he turned back, and glancing over his shoulder, came hurriedly back to the room. "'Did you see it, sir?' whispered George. "'Don't know,' said Malcolm shortly. "'I fancied I saw something. "'But it might have been fancy. "'I'm in the mood to see anything just now. "'How are you feeling now, sir?' "'Oh, I feel a bit better now,' said Hurst, somewhat brusquely, "'as all eyes were turned on him. "'I dare say you think I'm easily scared, but you didn't see it.' "'Not at all,' said Malcolm, smiling faintly, despite himself. "'I'm going to bed,' said Hurst, noticing the smile and resenting it. "'Will you share my room with me, Summers?' "'I will with pleasure,' said his friend, "'provided you don't mind sleeping with the gas on full all night.' He rose from his seat, and bidding the company a friendly good night, left the room with his crestfallen friend. The others saw them to the foot of the stairs, and having heard their door close, returned to the coffee room. "'Well, suppose the bet's off,' said the stout commercial, poking the fire and then standing with his legs apart on the hearth rug. "'So, as far as I can see, I won it. I never saw a man as scared in all my life. Sort of poetic justice about it, isn't there?' "'Never mind about poetry or justice,' said one of his listeners. "'Who's going to sleep with me?' "'I will,' said Malcolm affably. "'And I suppose we share a room together, Mr. Leake?' said the third man, turning to the fourth. "'No, thank you,' said the other briskly. "'I don't believe in ghosts. "'If anything comes into my room, I shall shoot it.' "'That won't hurt a spirit, Leake,' said Malcolm decisively. "'Well, the noise'll be like company to me,' said Leake, "'and it'll wake the house too.' "'But if you're nervous, sir,' he added with a grin to the man who had suggested sharing his room, "'George will be only too pleased to sleep on the doormat inside your room, I know.' "'That I will, sir,' said George fervently. "'And if you gentlemen would only come down with me to the bar to put the gas out, "'I could never be sufficiently grateful.' They went out in a body, with the exception of Leek, peering carefully before them as they went. George turned the light out in the bar, and they returned, unmolested, to the coffee room, and, avoiding the sardonic smile of Leek, prepared to separate for the night. "'Give me the candle while you put the gas out, George,' said the traveller. The waiter handed it to him and extinguished the gas, and at the same moment all distinctly heard a step in the passage outside. It stopped at the back door, and as they watched with bated breath, the door creaked and slowly opened. Malcolm fell back open-mouthed as a white, leering face with sunken eyeballs and close-cropped bullet head appeared in the opening. For a few seconds the creature stood regarding them, blinking in a strange fashion at the candle. Then, with a sidling movement, it came a little way into the room and stood there as if bewildered. Not a man spoke or moved, but all watched with a horrible fascination as the creature removed its dirty neckcloth and its head rolled on its shoulder. For a minute it paused and then, holding the rag before it, moved towards Malcolm. The candle went out suddenly with a flash and a bang. There was a smell of powder and something writhing in the darkness on the floor, a faint choking cough and then silence. Malcolm was the first to speak. M matches, he said, in a strange voice. George struck one. Then he leapt at the gas and the burner flamed from the match. Malcolm touched the thing on the floor with his foot and found it soft. He looked at his companions. They mouthed inquiries at him, but he shook his head. He lit the candle and, kneeling down, examined the silent thing on the floor. Then he rose swiftly, and dipping his handkerchief in the water jug, bent down again and grimly wiped the white face. Then he sprang back with a cry of incredulous horror, pointing at it. Leek's pistol fell to the floor, 
and he shut out the sight with his hands, but the others, crowding forward, gazed spellbound at the dead face of Hurst. Before a word was spoken, the door opened and Summers hastily entered the room. His eyes fell on the floor. Good God, he cried. You didn't. Nobody spoke. I, I told him not to, he said in a suffocating voice. I told him not to. I told him. He leaned against the wall, deathly sick, put his arms out feebly and fell fainting into the traveller's arms. A Fall of Snow by James Turner It happens every year about Christmas time. I have only to go into a shop to buy my Christmas cards and there is bound to be one of boys tobogganing in deep snow. Rather old-fashioned, I suppose, though whether there are fashions in snowfalls, I don't know. Nevertheless, to me, these cards bring it all back. There's generally a farmhouse in the background. An open gate with a robin in his crimson winter coat, great swags of snow on the hedgerows. In the centre of the picture, these two boys are flying downhill, waving their hands, their faces like red apples. Of course, it is an idealised, sort of Dickensian picture. For one thing, I'm certain, the boys careering downhill in the picture would never have had the time to wave. They would have been clinging too tightly to the toboggan. Further, it is an ideal Christmas picture, at least for my part of the country, Cornwall, where we rarely get enough snow to make a snowman, let alone toboggan. There had only been one year since I've lived in Cornwall when the snow was so thick that I was able actually to go onto the beach in the bay near my home and make a snowball and throw it into the sea. It was 1963, that very bad winter, and what I did must, uh, I feel, be some sort of record. So that these kind of Christmassy pictures are pleasant enough to send to a friend, but scarcely real. Yet what I remember when I see such a card is that it did once happen to me. It did once become very real indeed. And the two boys in that faraway real picture are David, my cousin, and myself. Of course, it's not so much the picture of two boys tobogganing that causes me even today to shiver slightly. It is the nature of fear itself. For fear is a very odd thing. I mean that now, today, when I'm so much older, I'm not in the least afraid of snow. It's merely a nuisance that has to be cleared away from the front door. It means cold weather, which I can't abide. Yet I'm still afraid of what happened so long ago, in that snowfall in East Anglia. But then, that Christmas of 1922, when my uncle invited me to spend the holiday at his home near Orford in Suffolk, snow was very much a novelty to me. It's difficult to explain exactly. Most childhood fears are when you look back at them from middle age. But when I remember that fear each year, I can only explain it by saying that something was waiting for me behind the snowstorm. Was it, I have often wondered, because I was fifteen and young for my age? Was it because snow was so great a novelty to me? Whereas to David, who lived all the year in East Anglia, and therefore knew the land well, as well as being used to snow, nothing happened. It really began when I arrived at my uncle's house. I had gone straight from school instead of going back to Cornwall, since my parents had gone to New York on business. It seemed odd at first to be going to Liverpool Street Station rather than to Paddington. When I left Sussex, the sun was shining, but the sky gradually clouded over, and by the time I had crossed London and the train left Liverpool Street, a light fall of snow covered the station roof. I was thrilled. If snow did come in any quantity, this was going to be a Christmas to remember. My uncle's car was waiting for me at Ipswich. I felt very grand being whisked through the town and into the lanes through Woodbridge and past the lonely farmhouses towards Orford. Although this was Christmas week, no one else but me and the chauffeur seemed to be about in that desolate landscape until we passed the old and secret wood of Staverton, 
where St. Edmund is reputed to have been martyred by the Danes. Then a couple, a man and a woman, emerged from beneath those gnarled and twisted oak and holly trees, with great bunches of red berries in their arms. It was a further sign of a good Christmas. As the car sped on, I looked back. They were walking in the centre of the road after us. I had the uncanny feeling, in the warmth of the car, that neither of them was real. And then they were gone in the turn of the road. So far, however, no snow had fallen here. But the lights from the house, every window seemed to be illuminated, fell on the gravel drive. The lawns were glittering with frost. My aunt, however, knew what was coming. She welcomed me into the hall, beside the stuffed bear with uplifted arms and paws, on which lay a silver tray for visiting cards. Her first words gave me hope. Nicky, dear, it's lovely to see you. David will be pleased. And I really believe we shall have snow for Christmas Day. You've brought it with you. How clever you are. Now you must come at once and get really warm. You must be frozen. I hardly remembered my uncle's house. It's true I had been in it once before, but that was in summer. Then, of course, I had run all over the farms helping, as I thought, the animals. I'd gone off with David often enough to the sea at Orford and Bordsey, and I knew of the merman who had, years ago, come out of the sea and stayed a while at Orford itself. He had been rather a pet with the inhabitants, until, one night, he had slipped away again across the marshes to the shore. It was said that the fact that the local vicar made him go to church and that he could not bear the long sermons he was forced to listen to any longer decided him to leave. From my own experience of church, I didn't blame him. David and I had also explored the old castle keep and the numerous martello towers along the coast. What I did remember, however, was that the farmhouse was a tall and impressive Queen Anne house that it had many rooms from the huge drawing room, the study, the dining room, to the bedrooms and attics, the maid servants. You have to remember that this was in the old fashioned days of 1922, when servants were still kept, lived in these attics and went down the back stairs to the kitchen and sculleries, pantries and dairies. The first time I had been ten years old. Even so, I was conscious of the warmth and comfort of real wealth even if farming was in a bad state, especially in East Anglia, though it was to get even worse later. The point was that my uncle did not depend on his farms for his income. That came from his business enterprises. I didn't know then what they were. Uh, truth to tell, I didn't care. All I knew was that it, Scarlet's it was called, with its endless acres, its workmen and farmers, was to me a wonderful playground and that David was a wonderful companion, making up new adventures each day and telling the most absurd lies each night as we lay in bed in his bedroom on the first floor, overlooking the woods back into the heart of Suffolk. This evening, four nights before Christmas 1922, what I remembered of the house was quite changed. The interior was alight with welcome. Whatever was to happen outside, in the house, there was safety and gaiety. The staircase was festooned with branches of green holly and ivy, paper chains and Chinese lanterns alternated with bunches of mistletoe, and the sideboard groaned under the weight of fruit and nuts. Furthermore, the house seemed full of servants. It didn't take much intelligence to sense all the other good things, plum puddings, mince pies, York hams that Mrs. Horsley, the cook, had up her sleeve for Christmas Day itself. While I was warming myself before the huge log fire in the drawing room, my uncle came in. He was a short man, thick set, rather Dickensian. He was smoking a cigar, and his first remark was what I should have expected of him. He always spoke in a ponderous manner, weighing his words as if everything he said was of the utmost importance. Now, of course, when I look back at him, it's easy to see him at the head of a boardroom table or deciding the fate of the companies under his command. But then he was a person I should not have cared to cross. After I had stood up and thanked him for asking me to come to stay, he shook hands with me in a formal manner and went on. I regret, Nicholas, he would never have dreamed of calling me Nicky. I regret very much the holly this year has few, I might almost say, no berries. And Christmas, you'll agree, depends largely for its full effect on red holly berries. 
Actually, I would have thought, and did even then, that it was brandy which really made Christmas for him. Neither did I dare to tell him that I had seen two people emerge from Staverton Forest so near his property with buried holly in their hands. He might have sacked one of his employees for not knowing the right place to go. And snow, Uncle, I exclaimed, catching sight of my cousin David coming down the stairs. It was snowing a little in London. Surely it'll come this way soon. Your aunt, my uncle said, who knows all about winds and weather, seems to think it will. She's making preparations for it too. And with that, he walked out of the room and no doubt, thinking that he had done all that could be expected of him towards a nephew of fifteen, shut himself in his study. I suppose it was just after eleven that we went to bed that first night. I was to sleep in David's room. We were hardly undressed when he said excitedly, You on, Nick? I had no idea what he was talking about, but I was not going to show myself a coward in front of him. Uh, y yes, of course. Uh, what do you mean? You haven't been here at a Christmas before, have you? Well, we're going to raid the servants, the young ones at least. He was laughing and rolling up one long football stocking into a ball and thrusting it into the foot of another, making a fairly soft, primitive club. But you might hurt someone with that, I said. Nonsense, Nick. He threw the club across the bed to me. It'll only give them a fright. Couldn't hurt them. He smiled in what I thought was a rather nasty manner and brought his wadded stocking down with a thump on the bed. We do this every year, he went on. What's more, they'll be expecting us, and there's generally some chap from school staying. None of them could come this year, though. I felt his contempt for me as a substitute. He banged the waddy, as he called it, down on the bed again. He laughed once more. We'll have to be careful we don't get hurt ourselves. Although it seemed silly to me, I followed him onto the dark landing. He flashed the torch, ran up the attic stairs silently and stood outside the second door on the right of the corridor. We don't have to worry about old Horsley, the cook. She's snoring her head off at the end of the corridor. Anyway, she never wakes up. He turned to me and whispered. We burst in and run straight across the room, lashing out with our waddies and then out again like a whirlwind. Don't waste any time once we're inside. I stood shivering outside the door in pyjamas and dressing gown, excited at the adventure and wrought up by David's mood. As he burst open the door, the light went on. Far from us, just running across the room, delivering a few well-aimed blows and out again, we were taken entirely by surprise. The maids were waiting for us, but so great was our impetus that we were amongst the three of them before we could stop. The noise of laughter and Davy's war whoops must have been terrific. I felt my club wrenched from my hand. I was tripped and fell across the bed. The lights suddenly went out and I felt myself firmly held down. I had no idea what happened to David or what was to happen to me. All I now really remember, because it was the first time it had happened to me, was that when the lights went on again, Helen, one of the housemaids, was holding me down and laughing at me. I was vaguely aware of my uncle shouting at us from below to be quiet. I tried to get up from Helen's bed, but I was too firmly held. Indeed, this was David's error of tactics. He forgot that all the maids had to do was to get hold of our arms and we would be helpless to wield our weapons. Oh no, Master Nicholas, Helen was saying as I heard my uncle roar again. You've lost the battle and you'll have to pay. Like this. I felt her hot lips on mine. She kissed me three times before she released me. Sweet, gentle kisses. Now go, she said, taking away the lovely warmth of her arms. And happy Christmas to you. I remember I ran out of their bedroom, between the other two beds, with all of them laughing, my face burning. The whole episode. It shows you the kind of escapade that David got up to. It had hardly taken more than ten minutes. Nevertheless, even now, I cannot forget Helen's face that night and the warmth of her kisses. Perhaps I would have forgotten if the snow had not come. And while we were asleep, it did come. No one heard it. No one was kept awake by its coming. But when I looked out of the bedroom window before dressing to go down for breakfast, there it was. The miracle which had begun at Liverpool Street Station was now clear to us all. I was caught up in the wonder of it and hardly heard David call out, Hurry up, Nick, and get dressed. Father's driving us over to Orlick's farm to get the turkey, and I bet we'll be able to toboggan. It's colossally thick. I did dress quickly. No doubt the smell of bacon and eggs coming up from the dining room would have hurried me anyway. I sat down between David and my aunt, and Helen brought me a plate of beautiful breakfast. 
She was smiling at me, as if we shared a secret. I suppose, in a rather schoolboy manner, I had fallen in love with her. The snow was still a wonder when we got into the car, the very suddenness of its coming, as it were, over the fields and woods behind the house, the amazing difference its coming made to everything, the joy of living inside a house and being able to run out into a world of icing sugar made its arrival the supreme Christmas present. To me, this landscape of gleaming white increased the mysteriousness of the countryside. It did more, now that I was actually out in it. It frightened me. For it was while my uncle was interviewing Andrews, his tenant at Orlick's farm, and examining the fallen roof of one of the barns, that David and I first got out into this whiteness. I was suddenly lost, I see that now that this vast expanse of white had torn away the edges of my familiar world. Where before I knew my way about, now everything, the fields, the trees, the church, even the cottages on my uncle's estate, was strange and terrifying. Every landmark changed. David had, of course, already formed one of his mad schemes. The snow didn't frighten him. He saw nothing at all strange in it. Only a phenomenon laid on for his special benefit. Only a natural event against which to pit his strength. He had the idea of pulling out into the untrodden snow the top half of the pigsty door and converting it into a toboggan. I went to help him lift it to where the field began to slope downwards to the valley below. Nothing could have made me tell him of my fears. In fact, I was rather proud that he considered me capable of helping him. The battle we had lost the night before was never mentioned. Y you sit in front, Nick, he said, throwing himself in a professional manner, full length at the back. I'll steer. I'm an expert at it. Even as I did what he told me, I recalled how, last night, as we stood outside the maid's door, his confidence had led him into error. Our craft, imbued all at once with a life of its own, sprang across the snow silently and with gathering speed. For one crazy moment it turned and twisted like a top, until, either under its own weight or David's feet, it righted its course. We shot downhill at what seemed to me a terrific speed. We were alone, cruising on a white sea, a vast opalescent ocean, with land before us in the shape of a gate opening between two ends of a hedge. Cold air was tearing into my lungs. My whole body was ecstatic with the cold and the fright of speed. I frantically grasped the iron ring used to open the door when it was in place. In a mad dream of pleasure and terror, I heard David's voice giving the command, as it were, from the bridge. I'm going to steer through the gate. Don't move. Hold on and keep your feet in. The sun, low over the approaching hedge, was burning with one great eye at me. The frail craft that we were adrift upon tore across the snow and, with an immense surge of power, drilled its way through the hedge opening, through the massive banks of hedge snow, shooting up the far hill, came to a stop. It was then that I felt the pain in my leg and the terror in my mind. Of the two, the terror was the worst. I bit back a cry. David was already off the wooden door and preparing to drag it back up the hill for a second ride. He looked at me where I was still lying in the snow. Hey, he said contemptuously, get up, Nick. Help me pull this thing to the top again. I'll show you something even better. I was astonished that he could be so calm that he made no reference to what I had seen, for surely he must have seen it too. I, I can't, David, I said. I'm afraid I can't. It, it's my leg. Something happened when we shot through the gate. For one brief moment, I saw the look of anger on his face, and then either from the sight of so much blood on the snow or because of the sharpness of the pain, I fainted. I gather, because David told me afterwards that I called out to him, get help for Helen, she's by the gate. I don't remember being taken back to my uncle's house. David told me the day my uncle and Andrews from the farm carried me to the car, and it turned out that I hadn't broken my leg after all. There must have been an iron spike on the gate concealed by the snow and it had ripped a long, deep wound in my calf as we shot through. It bled profusely. My aunt's doctor came and put in twelve stitches. But when I awoke in bed in one of the guest rooms, not in David's, warm and protected, it was not the accident to my leg which worried me. 
It was what had happened to Helen. She was lying against the hedge as we rushed through, a widening pool of blood issuing from her head and matting her hair. Her eyes were staring as if she were appealing to me for help. She was wearing a thin summer dress. In the short time I saw her, I was not only horrified by her accident, but also by the fact that she was out in this cold weather with no coat on. She must have been walking across the field, though why, when she would have had more than her share of work back at the house with everyone so busy, and slipped in some way and hit her head on the same iron projection which had ripped open the calf of my leg. She, like me, would have fainted from loss of blood. But now, here, in bed, I knew with a certainty I could not deny that Helen was dead, that help did not come in time to save her. I had expected something horrible to happen. I was convinced that this miracle of snow, which had so excited me when I could look at it from the house or the car, was malevolent. The unnaturalness of it, to one who was not used to it, was frightening. It, the snow, did not want me out in it. I was uneasy the moment I went into it with David. Unlike him, I was not master of every situation, nor was I able, as he was, to create situations which I could command. He would never have felt that something was hidden in this all-obscuring white blanket, suffocating, waiting to rush out at him in the same way that an open door at the head of a dark staircase may conceal something ready to spring out at your approach. I can explain it in no other way, but from the second the toboggan began to rush downhill, I saw the features of this threat rushing up to meet me as I was rushing to meet it. And then there was no stopping. And indeed I had been right, for here I lay in bed when I should have been enjoying the final preparations for Christmas. And Helen was dead. I was, too, acutely embarrassed at being such a nuisance. I almost wept at the thought that by my ineffectiveness or stupidity, as David would have called it, I was spoiling Christmas for everyone else. I didn't know that my aunt paid me several visits before I came out of the anaesthetic, but she was beside me when I did. Is it very painful, Nicky dear? she asked. Because if so, the doctor says that you can have a pill to ease it. No, Aunt Amy. I was propped up on pillows, and I dare say I looked white and wan. I put out my hand and touched hers as if, by so doing, I could grasp her protection. For this was the whole point of what had happened. The pain in my leg did not matter. I wasn't going to let her think that I couldn't stand it. But please, I asked, did they get to Helen in time? Was she still alive? My aunt smiled. She must have thought that I was still wandering under the effects of the anaesthetic. Helen, dear, there's nothing wrong with Helen. At least I hope not. We depend on her a great deal at a time like this. She's a good girl, but she was there in the snow. I saw her. She'd had an accident. She'd hit her head. Where, dear? By the gate. Just as we rushed through, it was horrible. She was lying there in a pool of blood. Did Uncle manage to save her? I suppose what I was saying must have sounded melodramatic to my aunt. She smiled again and pulled the sheets up to my chin. Nicky. You're not to worry about such things. You've been dreaming. A nasty dream, I agree. But when one hurts oneself and loses a lot of blood as you have, and then had an anaesthetic, you do have funny dreams. She got up from the bed. All you have to do is get strong again so that we can have you with us on Christmas Day. But aunt, I did see her. I did. And she was hurt. Well, we can soon prove it was all a dream, my dear. Besides, weren't you and David up in the maid's room last night? You made a great deal of noise, and I'm not sure that I approve of it at all. I suddenly remembered how Helen had held me then, the warmth of her arms. Now she was dead. I couldn't hold back my tears. It was obvious that my aunt thought me too weak to be told the truth. I'll send her up with a cup of cocoa, she said. That'll do you good, you see. As she shut the door, I don't think I expected to see Helen come in kind of resuscitated corpse. In my still fuddled state, I thought my aunt too was playing a macabre joke on me. It must have been ten minutes later that I heard the knock on the bedroom door. I shrank back into the bedclothes with fear. Helen came in carrying a tray. I must have stared at her in my fright. Master Nicholas, she laughed. Whatever's the matter? You look as if you'd seen a ghost. 
She put the tray down beside my bed as I gasped out. Is it really you, Helen? Of course it is, Master Nicholas. Here, take my hand. You'll soon find out. I did take her hand. It was warm and strong. She was laughing as she had laughed the night before. There, she said. I'm flesh and blood, aren't I? But, but, I stammered out, realising that what my aunt had said was true. It was all a dream. I had not seen Helen in the snow, covered with blood, dead. She was very much alive. But nothing, she said. You hurry up and get that leg well again, or Christmas will be spoiled. And hey, let go my hand. I've work to do, you know. Can't lie about in bed all day like some I know. Helen, I asked. Helen, it was last night David and I played that silly joke, wasn't it? It was. Very silly, too, since we knew all about it and expected you. And you did kiss me, didn't you? Three times. Well, Master Nicholas, that was all a bit of fun, really, wasn't it? I noticed that she was blushing. Then I begged, leaning towards her. Kiss me once again. It's important to me. She patted my hand gently. Whatever next, she laughed. Just suppose your aunt was to come in while we're at it. She won't, I said, and even if she did, I think she'd understand. Well, she laughed again, knowing nothing of my reasons for asking her to kiss me. If it'll make you better quickly, then, here. She leaned over and kissed me as warmly as she had the night before. When she had gone, I closed my eyes. So, after all, it was only hallucination. What still worried me, however, was the strangeness of the occurrence, and why I should have dreamed that I saw something in the snow that wasn't there, the semblance of Helen, dead. Because my life up to then had been completely normal. I was a normal boy who often trembled in mock fear of the supernatural, because for all my aunt said, for all Helen's kiss, I was not deceived. I knew that I had seen her in the snow as the iron cut into my leg. Like any other boy, I expected ghost stories at Christmas. That was the time for them. What I had not expected, and now feared, was that such things should actually become real could come out of some secret place and threaten every thread of normal life. I was convinced, as I sipped the cocoa Helen had brought me, that for a moment in the snow, out there, I had touched the rim of another hidden world, which had nothing to do with such things as school life, holidays, friendship. I was beginning to see, in a very immature way, that there were other realities beneath the life I lived so unthinkingly. I hardly heard my aunt say when she came to visit me again, You know what, Nicky? The snow isn't going to last long. I'm so sorry the wind has changed back to the south. Far from missing any festivities, I became what my uncle in his ponderous way called the centre of interest. He even went so far as to suggest that I was a bit of a hero and David himself was almost, but not quite, put in the shade. As I fell asleep the night before, when my aunt left me with her weather predictions, the house was full of noise. I heard my uncle go to the front door and invite inside the company of waits who were doing their best with Noel. David told me that his father had brewed a special bowl of punch for them. Two female cousins had arrived, and already a dance for New Year's Eve was being talked about. In the excitement of presents, the Christmas tree, the huge turkey, which my uncle carved with so much skill, I forgot what had happened two days ago, when Helen and the other maids were ushered in by Mrs. Horsley to drink the health of the company. I no longer worried about what I had thought I had seen. Time, as always on Christmas Day when I was young, passed so swiftly that I hardly noticed it. Almost before I realised it, my aunt was ordering me back to bed. My uncle and David carried me upstairs. I fell asleep at once. It shows what a normal kind of boy I was, for it never occurred to me that I should have any further bad dreams. When I woke, I lay for some minutes listening. Something was beating against the window panes. I was conscious, too, that something was missing, and yet at the same time I was filled with an amazing, overwhelming happiness. I looked at the chest of drawers where the presents I had been given were spread out like a shop window. But the explanation of my happiness was not there. It was some greater miracle. I got up and with great care put my injured leg to the floor. 
I could walk haltingly, clutching the edge of the table. I drew myself to the window. I caught my breath at the sight which met my eyes, for magically it seemed the snow had disappeared, and the noise I had heard was rain. A warm wind was blowing, everything. The stables, the church, the chimney pots of the cottages, the trees themselves were clearly outlined under the dawn light. My aunt had been right. As if someone had pulled off a white dust sheet from a room full of furniture, the countryside began visible. Now there was nowhere for anything to lurk, no spot so obscured by snow that it could hold a threat. Once again, the world was familiar and safe. I pulled open the window and leaned out into the warm rain which you sometimes get in late December. I watched a curl of smoke rise from a cottage chimney. Someone had lighted a fire. Christmas, but nothing really bad could happen, had even defeated the snow itself. By the middle of January I was back in Cornwall. I spent the next two Christmases with my parents who had returned from the States. In fact, one Christmas day it was so warm that I bathed in Trianion Bay just below our house. I hardly remembered the contrast from the Christmas of 1922. Now it was the summer term of 1924. I was beginning to enjoy school and had recently been made a prefect. Probably, as I was 17 and already thinking of following David to Oxford, not before time, I think it was a Thursday in the middle of July when Thompson, the head of my house and a great friend, called out to me as we passed in the long study corridor. See, your uncle's got his name in the telegraph. What do you mean? Well, he laughed and walked on. Seems he's been killing off his maids. I ran to the papers, which were always laid out on the table in the common room. There it was, on the front page. I recognised the picture at once. I had seen it before, though then snow covered that particular field and although the photograph did not show much of her face, I knew at once that it was Helen. I recognised the summer dress she was wearing as she lay beside the gate. In death, she was that small, woebegone figure I had seen in the snow over two years ago. The body of Helen Simpson, I read, unable to repress my shivering, holding on to the table tightly, so vivid were the pictures of what I had once seen in the snow. A maidservant in the household of Sir Thomas May, the financier, was found at about eleven o'clock yesterday morning beside a gate at Orlick's farm, owned by Sir Thomas, by his tenant, Mr James Andrews. A farmhand, assumed to be her lover, has been arrested and charged with her murder. The police are anxious to interview a boy of about fifteen, who Mr Andrews says ran off as he approached the body of the girl. Green Holly by Elizabeth Bowen. Mr. Rankstock entered the room with a dragging tread. Nobody looked up or took any notice. With a muted groan, he dropped into an armchair, out of which he shot with a sharp yelp. He searched the seat of the chair and extracted something. Your Holly, I think, Miss Bates, he said, holding it out to her. Miss Bates took it a second or two to look up from her magazine. W what? she said. Oh, it must have fallen down from that picture. Put it back, please. We haven't got very much. I regret, interposed Mr. Winterslow, that we haven't had any. It makes scratchy noises against the walls. It's seasonable, said Miss Bates firmly. You didn't do this to us last Christmas. Last Christmas, she said, I had Christmas leave this year. There seems to be none with berries. The birds have eaten them. If they were not a draught, the leaves wouldn't scratch the walls. I can't control the forces of nature, can I? How should I know, said Mr. Rankstock, lighting his pipe. These three by now felt that, like Chevalier and his old Dutch, they had been together for forty years, and to them it did seem a year too much. Actually, their confinement dated from 1940. They were experts in what the censor would not permit me to say. They were accounted for by their friends 
in London as being somewhere off in the country, nobody knows where, doing something frightfully hush-hush, nobody knows what. That is, they were accounted for in this manner if there were still anybody who still cared to ask. But on the whole, they had dropped out of human memory. Their reappearances in their former circles were infrequent, ghostly, and unsuccessful. Their friends could hardly disguise their pity, and for their own part they had not a word to say. They had come to prefer to spend leaves with their families, who at least showed a flattering pleasure in their importance. This Christmas it so worked out that there was no question of leave for Mr. Rankstock, Mr. Winterslow, or Miss Bates, with four others now playing or watching ping-pong in the next room. They composed in their high-grade way a skeleton staff. It may be wondered why, after years of proximity, they should continue to address one another so formally. They did not continue. They had begun again in the matter of appellations, as in that of intimacy. They had by now, in fact, by some time ago, completed the full circle. For some months they could not recall in which year Miss Bates had been engaged to Mr. Winterslow. Before that, she had been extremely friendly with Mr. Rankstock. Mr. Rankstock's deviation towards one Carla, now at her ping-pong in the next room, had been totally uninteresting to everybody, including, apparently, himself. If the war lasted, Carla might next year be called Miss Tongue. At present, Miss Bates was foremost in keeping her in her place by going on addressing her by her Christian name. If this felt like their fortieth Christmas in each other's society, it was their first in these particular quarters. You would not have thought, as Mr. Rankstock said, that one country house could be much worse than another, but this had proved, and was still proving, untrue. The army, for reasons it failed to justify, wanted the house they had been in since 1940, so they, lock, stock and barrel and files and all, had been bundled into another one six miles away. Since the move, tentative exploration, for there were none of them walkers, had established that they were now surrounded by rather more mud but fewer trees. What they did know was that their already sufficient distance from the market town, with its bars and movies, had now been added to by six miles. On the other side of their new home, which was called Mopsum Grange, there appeared to be nothing, unless, as Miss Bates suggested, swine herds keeping their swine. Mopsum Village contained villagers, evacuees, a church, a public house, on whose never-open door was chalked, no beer, no matches, no tea served, and a vicar. The vicar had sent up a nice note, saying he was not clear whether security regulations would allow him to call, and the doctor had been up once to lance one of Carla's boils. Mopsum Grange was neither old nor new. It replaced, unnecessarily, they all felt, a house on this site that had been burned down. It had a Gothic porch and gables, French windows, bow windows, a conservatory, a veranda, a hall which puce and buff tiled and pitch pine panelled rose to a gallery. In fact, every advantage. Jackdaws fidgeted in its many chimneys, for it had till the war stood empty. One had not to ask why. The hot water system made what Carla called rude noises, and was capricious in its supplies to the only two mahogany-rimmed baths. The electric light ran from a plant in the yard. If the batteries were not kept charged, the light turned brown. The three now sat in the drawing room, on whose walls mirrors and fitments long since removed left traces. There were, however, some pictures. General Montgomery, who had just shed his holly, and some lancer engravings that had been found in an attic. Three bulbs, naked, shed light manfully and in the grate the coal fire was doing far from badly. Miss Bates rose and stood twiddling the bit of holly. Something, she said, has got to be done about this. Mr. Winterslow and Miss Rankstock, the latter sucking his pipe, sank lower between their shoulder beds in their respective armchairs. Miss Bates, having drawn a breath, took a running jump at a table, which she propelled across the room with a grating sound. Achtung! She shouted at Mr. Rankstock, who, with an oath, withdrew his chair from her route. 
Having got the table under General Montgomery, Miss Bates, with a display of long, slender leg, clad in ribbed scarlet sports stockings, that was of interest to no one, mounted it, then proceeded to tuck the holly back into position over the general's frame. Meanwhile, Mr. Winterslow, choosing his moment, stealthily reached across her empty chair and possessed himself of her magazine. What a hope! Miss Bates was known to have eyes all the way down her spine. "'Damn you, Mr. Winterslow,' she said. "'Put that down!' Mr. Rankstock, interfere with Mr. Winterslow. Mr. Winterslow has taken my magazine. She ran up and down the table like something in a cage. Mr. Rankstock removed his pipe from his mouth, dropped his head back, gazed up and said, "'Gad, Miss Bates, you look fine.' "'It's a pretty old magazine,' murmured Mr. Winterslow, flicking the pages over. "'Well, you're pretty old,' she said. "'I hope Carla gets you.' "'Oh, I can do better, thank you.' I've got a ghost. This confidence was cut off by Mr. Rankstock's having burst into song, holding his pipe at arm's length, rocking on his bottom in his armchair, he led them. Hey ho, sing hey ho, unto the green holly, most friendship is feigning, most loving mere folly. Mere folly, mere folly, contributed Mr. Winterlow, picking up, joining in. Both sang. Then hey ho the holly, this life is most jolly. Now all, said Mr. Rankstock, jerking his pipe at Miss Bates. So all three went through it once more, with degrees of passion. Miss Bates, when others desisted, being left singing, Hey ho, sing, hey ho, sing, all by herself. Next door, the ping pong came to an awestruck stop. At any rate, said Mr. Rankstock, we all like Shakespeare. Miss Bates, whose intelligence like her singing tonight seemed some way off at the tail of the hunt, looked blank, began to get off the table and said, But I thought that was a Christmas carol. The companions shrugged and glanced at each other. Having taken her magazine away from Mr. Winterslow, she was once more settling down to it when she seemed struck. What was that you said about you had got a ghost? Mr. Winterslow looked down his nose. At this early stage, I don't like to say very much. In fact, on the whole, forget it, if you don't mind. Look, Mr. Rankstock said, if you started seeing things. I'm only sorry, his colleague said, that I've spoke. Oh, no, you're not, said Miss Bates. And we better know just what is fishy about this Grange. There's nothing fishy, said Mr. Winterslow in a fastidious tone. It was hard indeed to tell from his manner whether he did or did not regret having made a start. He had reddened, but not perhaps wholly painfully. His eyes, now fixed on the fire, were at once bright and vacant. With unheeding, fumbling movements, he got out a cigarette lit it, and dropped the match on the floor to slowly burn one more hole in the fibre mat. Gripping the cigarette between tense lips, he first flung his arms out, as though casting off a cloak, then pressed both hands clasped firmly to the nerve centre in the nape of his neck, as though to contain the sensation there. She was marvellous, he brought out, what I could see of her. Don't talk with a cigarette in your mouth, Miss Bates said. Young, adorably, not so very. At the same time, quite... Uh, oh, well, you know what I mean. Uh-huh, said Miss Bates. And wearing? I am certain she had a feather boa. You mean, Mr. Rankstock said, that this uh, brushed your face. And when and where did this happen, said Miss Bates, with legal coldness. Cross-examination clearly became more and more repugnant to Mr. Winterslow in his present mood. He shut his eyes, sighed bitterly, heaved himself from his chair and said, Oh, well, and stood indecisively looking towards the door. Don't let us keep you, said Miss Bates. But one thing I don't see is, if you're being fed with the beautiful thoughts, why you wanted to keep on taking my magazine. I wanted to be distracted. Huh? There are moments 
Well, I don't quite know where I am. You surprise me, said Mr. Rankstock. Good God, man! What is the matter? For Mr. Winterslow, like a man being swooped around by a bat, was revolving, staring from place to place, high up round the walls of the gauntlet room. Miss Bates observed, Well, now we have started something. Mr. Rankstock, considerably kinder, said, That is only Miss Bates' holly flittering in the wind. Mr. Winterslow gulped. He walked to the inch of the mirror propped on the mantelpiece, and, as nonchalantly as possible, straightened his tie. Having done this, he said, But there isn't a wind tonight. The ghost hesitated in the familiar corridor. Her visibleness, even on Christmas Eve, was not under her own control. And now she had fallen in love again. Her dependence upon it began to dissolve in patches. This was a concentration of every feeling of the woman prepared to sail downstairs, en grand tenue. Flamboyance and agitation were both present. But between these, because of her years of death, there cut an extreme anxiety. It was not merely a matter of how was she, but of was she tonight at all. Death had left her to be her own mirror, for into no other was she able to see. For tonight she had discarded the feather boa, it had been dropped into the limbo that was her wardrobe now. Her shoulders she knew were bare, round their bareness shimmered a thousand evenings. Her own person haunted her, above her forehead the crisp springy weight of her pompadour, round her feet the frou-frou of her skirts on a thick carpet, in her nostrils the scent from her corsage, up and down her forearm the glittery slipping of bracelets warmed by her own blood. It is the haunted who haunt. There were lights in the house again. She heard laughter, and then there had been singing. From those few dim lights and untrue notes, her senses, after their starvation, set going the whole grand opera again. She smiled and moved down the corridor to the gallery where she stood looking down into the hall. The tiles of the hall floor were as pretty as ever, as cold as ever and bore, as always on Christmas Eve, the trickling pattern of dark blood. The figure of the man with the side of his head blown out lay there, as always, one foot just touching the lower step of the stairs. It was too bad. She had been silly, but it couldn't be helped. They shouldn't have shut her up in the country. How could she not make hay while the sun shone? The year round, no man except her husband, his uninteresting jealousy, his dull passion. Then at Christmas, so many men that one didn't know where to turn. The ghost, leaning further over the gallery, pouted down at the suicide. She said, you should have let me explain. The man made no answer. He never had. Behind a door somewhere downstairs, a racket was going on. The house sounded funny. There were no carpets. The morning room door was flung open and four flushed people, headed by a young woman, charged out. They clattered across the man in a trickling pattern as though there were nothing there but the tiles. In the morning room, she saw one small white ball trembling to stillness upon the floor. As the people rushed the stairs and fought for place in the gallery, the ghost drew back. A purest act of repugnance, for this was not necessary. The young woman, to one of whose temples was strapped a cotton wool pad, held her place and disappeared round a corner, exulting, My bath! My bath! Then may you freeze in it, Carla returned the scrawniest of the defeated ones. The words pierced the ghost, who trembled. They did not know. Who were they? She didn't ask. She didn't care. She never had been inquisitive. Information had bored her. Her schooled lips had framed one set of questions, her eyes a consuming other. Now the mills of death with their catching wheels had stripped her of semblance, cast her forth on an everlasting holiday from pretense. She was left with, nay, had to become her obsession. 
Thus it is to be a ghost. The ghost fixed her eyes on the other, the drawing room door. He had gone in there. He would have to come out again. The handle turned, the door opened. Winterslow came out. He shut the door behind him with the sedulous slowness of an uncertain man. He had been humming, and now, squaring his shoulders, began to sing, Mere folly, mere folly. As he crossed the hall towards the foot of the staircase, obstinately never raising his eyes. So it is you, breathed the ghost with unheard softness. She gathered about her with a gesture not less proud for being tormentedly uncertain, the total of her visibility. Was it possible diamonds should not glitter now on her rising and falling breast and swept from the gallery to the head of the stairs? Winterslow shivered violently and looked up. He licked his lips. He said, This cannot go on. The ghost's eyes with tender impartiality and mockery from above swept Winterslow's face, the hair receding, the furrowed forehead, the tired sag of the jowl, the strain reddened eyelids, the blue shaved chin. Nothing was lost on her, nothing broke the spell. With untroubled wonder she saw his hand-woven tie, his coat pockets shapeless as saddlebags, the bulging knees of his flannel trousers. Wonder went up in rhapsody, so much chaff in the fire. She never had had illusions. The illusion was all. Lovers cannot be choosers. He'd do. He would have to do. I know, she agreed with rapture, casting her hands together. We're mad, you and I. Oh, what's going to happen? I entreat you to leave this house tonight. Winterslow, in a dank and resounding voice, said, and anyhow, what made you pick me? It's kismet, wailed the ghost zestfully. Why did you have to come here? Why you? I have been so peaceful, just like a little girl. People spoke of love, but I never knew what they meant. Oh, I wish we had never met you and I. Winterslow said, I've been here for three months. We have all of us been here, as a matter of fact. Why all of this all of a sudden? She said, there's a Christmas Eve party, isn't there, going on? One Christmas Eve party, there was a terrible accident. Oh, comfort me. No one has understood. Don't stand there. I can't bear it, just not there. Winterslow, whether he heard or not, cast a scared glance down at his feet, which were in slippers, then shifted a pace or two to the left. Let me up, he said wildly. I tell you, I want my spectacles. I just want to get my spectacles. Let me buy. Let you up, the ghost marvelled. But I'm only waiting. She was more than waiting. She set up a sort of suction, an icy indrawing draught. Nor was this wholly psychic, for an isolated holly leaf of Miss Bates's dropped at the turn of the staircase twitched, and not, you could think, by chance did the electric light choose this moment for one of its brown fade-outs. Gradually the scene, the hall, the stairs, and the gallery faded under this fog-dark but glass-clear veil of hallucination. The feet of Winterslow under remote control began with knocking unsureness to mount the stairs. At their turn he staggered steadied himself, and then stamped derisively upon the holly leaf. Bah! he neighed. Spectacles! By the ghost now putting out everything, not a word would be dared. Where are you? Weakly her dress rustled three steps down. The rings on her hand knocked weakly over the panelling. Here! Oh, here! she sobbed. Where I was before! Hell, said Miss Bates, who had opened the drawing-room door and was looking resentfully round the hall. This electric light! Mr. Rankstock, from inside the drawing-room, said, Find the man. The man has gone to the village, Mr. Rankstock. If you were half a man, Mr. Winterslow, what are you doing kneeling down on the stairs? Have you come over funny? Really, this is the end. 
At the other side of a bay's door, one of the installations began ringing. Mr. Rankstock, Miss Bates yelled implacably, yours this time. Mr. Rankstock, with an expression of hatred, whipped out a pencil and pad and shambled across the hall. Under cover of this, Mr. Winterslow pushed himself upright, brushed his knees and began to descend the stairs to confront his colleague's narrow but not unkind look. Weeks of exile from any hairdresser had driven Miss Bates to the Alice in Wonderland style. A snood, tied at the top, was now thrust back, adding inches to her pale, polished brow. Nicotine stained the fingers she closed upon Mr. Winterslow's elbow, propelling him back to the drawing room. There's always drink, she said. Come along. He said hopelessly, if you mean the bottle between the filing cabinets, uh, I finished that when I had to work last night. Look here, Miss Bates. Why should she have picked on me? It has been broken off, then, said Miss Bates. I'm sorry for you, but I don't like your tone. I resent your attitude to my sex. For that matter, why did you pick on her? Romantic, nostalgic, blue Danube fixated, huh? There's Carla. An understanding girl, unselfish, getting over her boils. There are Avis and Lettuce, due back on Boxing Day. There's me, as you have ceased to observe. But, oh dear, no. We do not trail feather boas. She only wore that in the afternoon. Now let me tell you something, said Miss Bates. When I opened the door just now to have a look at the lights, what do you think I first saw there in the hall? A uh, uh, me? replied Mr. Winterslow with returning assurance. Oh, no. Oh, indeed, no, said Miss Bates. You? Why should I think twice of that if you were striking attitudes on the stairs? You? No. I saw your enchanting inverse, extended as it is true stone dead. I saw the man of my dreams. From his attitude it was clear he had died for love. There were three pearl studs in his boiled shirt, and his white tie must have been tied in heaven. And the hand that dropped the pistol had dropped a white rose. It lay beside him, brown and crushed from having been often kissed. The ideality of those kisses, for the last of which I arrived too late. Here Miss Bates beat her fist against the bow of her snood will haunt and by haunting satisfy me. The destruction of his features before I saw them made their former perfection certain where I am concerned, and here I am, left, 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 to watch dust gather on Mr. Rankstock and you, to watch, yes, I who saw in a flash the ink-black perfection of his tailoring, mildew form on those clothes that you never change, to remember how both of you had in common that way of blowing your noses before you kissed me. He had been deceived, hence the shot, hence the fall. But who was she, your feathered friend, to deceive him? Who could have deceived him more superbly than I? I could be fatal, moaned Miss Bates, pacing the drawing room. I could be fatal. Only give me a break. Well, well I'm sorry, said Mr. Winterslow, but really, what can I do? Or poor Rangstock do. We're just ourselves. You put the thing in a nutshell, said Miss Bates. Perhaps I could bear it if you just got your hairs cut. If it comes to that, Miss Bates, you might get your set. Mr. Rangstock's re-entry into the drawing room, this time with brisker step for a nice little lot of new trouble was brewing up, synchronised with the fall of the piece of holly again from the general's frame to the Rangstock chair. This time he saw it in time. Your holly, I think, Miss Bates, he said, holding it out to her. We must put it back, said Miss Bates. We haven't got very much. I cannot see, said Mr. Winterslow, why we should have any. I don't see the point of holly without berries. Uh, the birds have eaten them, said Miss Bates. I cannot control the forces of nature, can I? Then hey, ho, sing, hey, ho, Mr. Rankstock led off. Yes, she said. Let us have that pretty carol again.
The Waiting Room by Robert Aikman Against such interventions of fate as this, reflected Edward Pendlebury, there was truly nothing that the wisest and most far-sighted could do, and the small derangement of his plans epitomised the larger derangement which was life. All the way from Grantham it had been uncertain whether the lateness of the train from King's Cross would not result in Pendlebury missing the connection at York. The ticket inspector thought that they might hold it, but Pendlebury's fellow passengers, all of them businessmen who knew the line well, were sceptical and seemed to imply that it was among the inspector's duties to soothe highly strung passengers. This is a Scarborough train, said one of the businessmen several times. It's not meant for those who want to go further north. Pendlebury knew perfectly well that it was a Scarborough train. It was the only departure he could possibly catch, and no one denied that the timetable showed a perfectly good, though slow, connection. Nor could anyone say why the express was late. It transpired that the connection had not been held. Other people want to get home besides you, said the man at the barrier when Pendlebury complained rather sharply. There were two hours to wait, and Pendlebury was warned that the train would be very slow indeed. The milk and mail, we call it, said his informant. But it does go there, in the end. Already it was late at night, and the refreshment room was about to close. The uncertainty regarding the connection had made Pendlebury feel a little sick, and now he found it difficult to resume reading the government publication, the contents of which it was necessary for him to master before the next day's work began. He moved from place to place, reading and rereading the same page of technicalities, from a drafty seat under a light to a waiting room, and when the waiting room was invaded by some over-jolly sailors, to the adjoining hotel, where his request for coffee seemed to be regarded as insufficient. In the end, it was long before the train was due when he found his way to the platform from which his journey was to be resumed. A small but bitterly cold wind was now blowing through the dark station from the north. It hardly sufficed to disturb the day's accumulation of litter. But nonetheless, froze the fingers at a touch. The appearance of the train, therefore, affected a disproportionate revival in Pendlebury's spirits. It was composed of old stock, but nonetheless comfortable for that. The compartment was snugly heated, and Pendlebury sat in it alone. The long journey began just in time for Pendlebury to hear the minster clock clanging midnight as the train slowly steamed out. Before long, it had come to rest again, and the bumping of milk churns began, and ultimately crashing, at stately intervals, to the remote wayside platforms. Observing, as so many late travellers before him, that milk seems to travel from the town to the country, Pendlebury, despite the thuds, fell asleep, and took up the thread of anxiety which he so regularly followed to the caves of the night. He dreamed of the world's unsympathy, of projects hopefully begun but soon unreasonably overturned, of happiness filched away. Finally he dreamed that he was in the south of France. Although he was alone, it was beautiful and springtime, until suddenly a bitter wind descended upon him from nowhere, and he awoke hot and cold simultaneously. All change. The door of the compartment was open and the porter was addressing him. Where are we? Casterton. Train stops here. I want Wykeby. Wykeby's on the main line. Six stations passed. When's the next train back? Not till 6.30. The guard had appeared, stamping his feet. All out, please. We want to go to bed. Pendlebury rose to his feet. He had cramp in his left arm and could not hold his suitcase. The guard pulled it out and set it on the platform. Pendlebury alighted and the porter shut the door. He jerked his head to the guard who clicked at the green slide of his lantern. The train slowly steamed away. "'What happens to passengers who arrive here fast asleep?' asked Pendlebury. "'I can't be the first on this train.' "'This train is not rightly meant for passengers,' replied the porter. Not beyond the main line, that is. I missed the connection. The London train was late. Maybe, said the porter. The northerner's view of the south was implicit in his tone. 
The train could be seen coming to rest in a siding. Suddenly, all its lights went out. Casterton's quite a big place, I believe. Midlin, said the porter. He was a dark-featured man with a saturnine expression. What about a hotel? Not since the arms were sold up. The new people don't do rooms, can't get the labour. Well, what am I to do? The realisation that it was of no business of the porter to answer this question made Pendlebury sound childish and petulant. The porter looked at him. Then he jerked his head as he had done to the guard and began to move away. Picking up his suitcase, and the other hand was still numb and disembodied, Pendlebury followed him. Snow was beginning to fall, not in flakes, but in single stabbing spots. The porter went first to a small office, lighted by a sizzling tilly lamp and heated to stuffiness by a crackling coke stove. Here he silently performed a series of obscure tasks while Pendlebury waited. Finally, he motioned Pendlebury out, drew the fire, extinguished the light and locked the door. Then he lifted from its bracket the single oil lamp which illuminated the platform and opened the door marked General Waiting Room. Once more he jerked his head. This time he was holding the light by his dark face. And Pendlebury was startled by the suddenness and violence of the movement. It was a wonder that the porter didn't injure his neck. Mind you, I'm not taking any responsibility. If you choose to spend the night, it's entirely at your own risk. It's not a matter of choice, rejoined Pendlebury. It's against the regulations to use the waiting rooms for any purpose but waiting for the company's trains. They're not the company's trains anymore. They're supposed to be our trains. Presumably the porter had heard that too often to consider it worth reply. You can keep this lamp while the oil lasts. Thank you, said Pendlebury. What about a fire? Not since before the war. I see, said Pendlebury. I suppose you're sure there's nowhere else. Have a look if you want to. Through the door, Pendlebury could see the drops of snow scudding past like icy shrapnel. I'll stay here. After all, it's only a few hours. The responsibilities of the morrow were already ranging themselves around Pendlebury, ready to topple and pounce. The porter placed the lamp on the polished yellow table. Don't forget, it's nothing to do with me. If I'm not awake, I suppose someone will call me in time for the 6.30. Yes, said the porter. You'll be called. Good night, said Pendlebury, and thank you. The porter neither answered nor even nodded. Instead, he gave that violent twist or jerk of his head. Pendlebury realised that it must be a twitch, perhaps partly voluntary, partly involuntary. Now that he had seen it in the light, its extravagance frightened him. Going, the porter slammed the door sharply, from which Pendlebury deduced also that the lock must be stiff. As well as the yellow table, the waiting room contained four long seats stoutly upholstered in shiny black. Two of these seats were set against the back wall, with the empty fireplace between them, and one against each of the side walls. The seats had backs, but no arms. There were also two objects in hanging frames. One was the address of the local representative of an organisation concerned to protect unmarried women from molestation when away from home. The other, a black and white photograph of the old Bailey, described, Pendlebury observed, as the new central criminal court. Faded, as though the scene now was, the huge blind figure which surmounted the dome still stood out blackly against the pale sky. The streets were empty. The photograph must have been taken at dawn. Pendlebury's first idea was to move the table to one side and then bring up one of the long seats so that it stood alongside another, thus making a wider couch for the night. He set the lamp on the floor and going around to the other end of the table began to pull. The table remained immovable. Supposing this to be owing to its obviously great weight, Pendlebury increased his efforts. Then he saw, as the rays of the lantern advanced towards him across the dingy floorboards, that at the bottom of each leg were four L-shaped metal plates, one each side, by which the leg was screwed to the floor. The plates and the screws were dusty and rusty, but solid as a battleship. It was an easy matter to confirm that the four seats were similarly secured. 
the now extinct company took no risks with its property. Pendlebury tried to make the best of a single bench, one of the pair divided by the fireplace, but it was both hard and narrow, and curved sharply upwards to its centre. It was even too short, so that Pendlebury found it difficult to dispose of his feet. So cold and uncomfortable was he, that he hesitated to put out the sturdy lamp. But in the end, he did so. Apart from anything else, Pendlebury found that the light just sufficed to fill the waiting room with dark places, which changed their shape and kept him wakeful with speculation. He found also that he was beginning to be obsessed with the minor question of how long the oil would last. With his left hand steadying the overcoat under his head, most fortunately he had packed a second country one for use if the weather proved really cold, he turned down the small notched flame with his right, then lifting the lamp from the table, blew it out. Beyond the waiting room it was so dark that the edges of the two windows were indistinct. Indeed, the two patches of tenuous foggy grayness seemed to appear and disappear like the optical illusions found in Christmas crackers. If there was any chance of Pendlebury's eyes becoming accustomed to the light, it was now dissipated in drowsiness. Truly, Pendlebury was very tired indeed. Not, of course, that he was able to sleep deeply or unbrokenly. Tired as he was, he slept as all must sleep upon such an unwelcoming couch. Many times he woke, with varying degrees of completeness. Sometimes it was a mere half-conscious adjustment of his limbs, twice or thrice a plunging start into full vitality. He noticed that the wind had begun to purr and creak in the choked-up chimney. Most often it was an intermediate state, a surprisingly cosy awareness of relaxation and irresponsibility, when he felt an extreme disinclination for the night to end, and for the agony of having to arise and walk. Pendlebury began to surmise that discomfort, even absurd discomfort, could recede and be surmounted with no effort at all. Almost he rejoiced in his adaptability. He seemed no longer even to be cold. He had read, in the context of polar expedition, that this could be a condition of peculiar danger, a lethal delusion. If so, it seemed also a happy delusion, and Pendlebury was surfeited with reality. Certainly, the wind was rising. Every now and then a large, invisible snowflake, the snow seemed no longer to be coming in bullets, slapped against one of the windows like a gobbet of paste, and secret little draughts were beginning to flit even about the solidly built waiting room. At first, Pendlebury became aware of them neither by feeling nor by hearing, but before long they were stroking his face and turning his feet to ice, which in convenience also he proved able to disregard without effort. In a spell of wakefulness, still surprisingly unattended with discomfort, he began to speculate on the stormy windswept town which no doubt surrounded the lifeless station, the yeomanry slumbering in their darkened houses, the freezing streets paved with lumpy granite sets, the occasional lover, the rare lawbreaker, both withdrawn into deep doorways. Into such small upland communities until two or three centuries ago, wolves had come down at night from the fells when snow was heavy. From these reflections about a place he had never seen, Pendlebury drew a curious contrasting comfort. Suddenly, the wind loosened the soot in the chimney. There was a rustling, rumbling fall which seemed as if it would never end, and Pendlebury's nostrils were stuffed with dust. Horribly reluctant, he dragged himself upwards. Immediately his eyes too were affected. He could see nothing at all. The dim windows were completely gone. Straining for his handkerchief, he felt the soot even on his hands. His clothes must be smothered in it. The air seemed opaque and impossible to breathe. Pendlebury began to cough, each contraction penetrating and remobilizing his paralyzed limbs. As one sinking into an ice pack, he became conscious of deathly cold. It was as if he would never breathe again. 
The thickness of the air seemed even to be increasing. The sooty dust was whirling about like a sandstorm, impelled by the draughts which seemed to penetrate the stone walls on all sides. Soon he will be buried beneath it. As even his coughing began to strangle in his throat, Pendlebury plunged towards the door. Immediately he struck the heavy screwed down table. He stumbled back to his bench. He was sure that within minutes he would be dead. But gradually he became aware that again there was a light in the waiting room. Although he couldn't tell when it had passed from imperception to perception, there was the tiniest, faintest red glow, which was slowly but persistently waxing. It came from near the door, just at the end of Pendlebury's bench. He had to crick his neck in order to see it at all. Soon he realized that, of course, it was in the fireplace. All this time, after the commencement of the war, once again, there was a fire. It was just what he wanted, now that he was roused from his happy numbness into the full pain of the cold. Steadily the fire brightened and sparkled into the genial crepitation of life. Pendlebury watched it grow and began to feel the new warmth lapping at his fingers and toes. He could see that the air was still thick with black particles rising and falling between floor and ceiling, and sometimes twisting and darting about as if independently alive. But he had ceased to choke and cough and was able again to sink his head upon the crumpled makeshift pillow. He stretched his legs as life soaked into them. Lethargy came delightfully back. He could see now that the dust was thinning all the time, no doubt settling on the floor and hard resisting furniture. The fire was glowing ever more strongly, and to Pendlebury it seemed in the end that all the specks of dust had formed themselves into the likeness of living, writhing Byzantine columns, which spiralled their barley sugar walls through the very texture of the air. The walls were rapidly losing density, however, and the rosy air clearing. As the last specks danced and died, Pendlebury realised that the waiting room was full of people. There were six people on the side bench, which started near his head, and he believed as many on the corresponding bench at the opposite side of the room. He couldn't count the number on the other bench because several more people obscured the view by sitting on the table. Pendlebury could see further shadowy figures on the bench which stood against his own wall the other side of the fireplace. The people were of both sexes and all ages and garbed in the greatest imaginable variety. They were talking softly but seriously to one another. Those nearest the fire sometimes stretched a casual hand toward the flames, as people seated near to a fire usually do. Indeed, Except perhaps for the costume of some of them, one woman wore a splendid evening dress. There was but one thing unusual about these people. Pendlebury couldn't precisely name it. They looked gentle and charming, and in every way sympathetic, those who looked rich and those who looked poor. But Pendlebury felt that there was about them some single uncommon thing which, if he could find it, would unite and clarify their various distinctions. Whatever this thing was, Pendlebury was certain that it was shared by him with the people in the waiting room, and with few others. He then reflected that naturally he was dreaming. To realize that one is dreaming is customarily disagreeable so that one strains to awake, but than this dream, Pendlebury wanted nothing better. The unexpected semi-tranquility he had before at times felt in the comfortless waiting room was now made round and complete. He lay back with a sigh to watch and listen. On the side bench next to him, with her shoulder by his head, was a pretty girl wearing a black shawl. Pendlebury knew that she was pretty, although much of her face was turned away from him, as she gazed at the young man seated beside her, whose hand she held. He too had looks in his own way, Pendlebury thought, about both the clothes and the general aspect of the pair was something which recalled a 19th century picture by an academician. Nonetheless, it was instantly apparent that each lived only for the other. Their love was like a magnifying glass between them. On the near corner of the bench at the other side of the fire sat an imposing old man. He had a bushel of silky white hair, 
a fine brow, a commanding nose, and the mien of a philosopher king. He sat in silence, but from time to time smiled slightly upon his own thoughts. He too seemed dressed in past fashion. Those seated upon the table were unmistakably of today. Though mostly young, they appeared to be old friends, habituated to trusting one another with the truth. They were at the centre of the party, and their animation was greatest. It was to them that Pendlebury most wanted to speak. The longing to communicate with these quiet, happy people soon reached a passionate intensity which Pendlebury had never before known in a dream, but only very occasionally upon awaking from one. But now, though warm and physically relaxed, almost indeed disembodied, Pendlebury was unable to move, and the people in the waiting room seemed unaware of his presence. He felt desperately shut off from a party he was compelled to attend. Slowly, but unmistakably, the tension of community and sodality waxed among them, as if a loose mesh of threads weaving about between the different individuals was being drawn tighter and closer, further isolating them from the rest of the world and from Pendlebury. The party was advancing into a communal phantasmagoria, as parties should, but in Pendlebury's experience, seldom did. An ombre chinoise of affectionate ease and intensified inner life. Pendlebury so plainly belonged with them. His flooding sensation of identity with them was the most authentic and the most momentous he had ever known. But he was wholly cut off from them. There was, he felt, a bridge which they had crossed and he had not and they were the select best of the world from different periods and classes and ages and tempers, the nicest people he had ever known, were it only that he could know them. And now, the handsome evening in evening dress, Edwardian evening dress, Pendlebury thought, Decolleté but Polypetalus was singing, and the rest were hushed to listen. She was singing a drawing-room ballad of home and love and paradise, Elsewhere, doubtless absurd, but here, sweet and moving, made so in part by her steady mezzo-soprano voice and soft, intimate pitch. Pendlebury could see only her pale face and bosom in the firelight, the shadow of her dark hair massed tight on the head above her brow, the glinting and gleaming of the spirit caught within the large jewel at her throat, the upward angle of her chin, but more and more as she sang, it was as if a broad knife turned round and round in his heart, scooping it away. And all the time he knew that he had seen her before, and knew also that in dreams there is little hope of capturing such mighty lost memories. He knew that soon there would be nothing left, and that it was necessary to treasure the moments which remained. The dream was racing away from him like a head of water when the sluice is drawn. He wanted to speak to the people in the waiting room, even inarticulately to cry out to them for rescue, and could feel that the power, hitherto cut off, would soon be once more upon him. But all the time the rocks and debris of the common life were ranging themselves before him as the ebbing dream uncovered them more and more. When he could speak, he knew that there was no one to speak to. In the doorway of the waiting room stood a man with a lantern. All right, sir. The courtesy suggested that it was not the porter of the previous night. Pendlebury nodded. Then he turned his face to the wall, out of the lantern's chilly beam. All right, sir, said the man again. He seemed to be sincerely concerned. Pendlebury, alive again, began to pick his way from lump to lump across the dry but muddy watercourse. Thank you. I'm all right. He still felt disembodied with stiffness and numbness and cold. You know, you shouted at me. More like a scream it was. Not a nice thing to hear in the early morning. The man was quite friendly. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, what's the time? Just turned the quarter. There's no need to be sorry, so long as you're all right. I'm frozen, that's all. I've got a cup of tea brewed for you in the office. I found the other porter's note when I opened up this morning. He did not have put you in here. Pendlebury had forced both his feet to the floor and was feebly brushing down his coat with his congealed hands. There was no choice. I missed my station. I understand there's nowhere else to go. He did not have put you in here, sir, repeated the porter. You mean the regulations? He warned me about them. 
The porter looked at Pendlebury's dishevelled mass on the hard, dark bench. I'll go and pour out that tea. When he had gone, Pendlebury perceived through the door the first frail foreshadowing of the slow northern dawn. Soon he was able to follow the porter to the little office. Already the stove was roaring. That's better, sir, said the porter as Pendlebury sipped the immensely strong liquor. Pendlebury had begun to shiver, but he turned his head towards the porter and tried to smile. Reckon anything's better than a night in Casterton waiting room for the matter of that, said the porter. He was leaning against the high desk with his arms folded and his feet set well apart before the fire. He was a middle-aged man with grey eyes and the look of one who carried responsibilities. I expect I'll survive. I expect you will, sir, but there's some who didn't. Pendlebury lowered his cup to the saucer. He felt that his hand was shaking too much for dignity. Oh, he said. How's that? More tea, sir. No, I've got half a cup to go yet. The porter was regarding him gravely. You don't know that Casterton Station's built on the site of the old jail? Pendlebury tried to shake his head. The waiting room's on top of the burial ground. The burial ground? That's right, sir. One of the people there is Lily Torelli, the beautiful nightingale. Reckon they hadn't much heart in those times, sir, not when it came to the point. Pendlebury said nothing for a long minute. Far away he could hear a train. Then he asked, Did the other porter know this? He did, sir. Didn't you notice? Notice what? The porter said nothing, but simply imitated the other porter's painful and uncontrollable twitch. Pendlebury stared. Terror was waxing with the cold sun. The other porter used to be a bit too partial to the bottle. One night he spent the night in that waiting room himself. Oh, why do you tell me this? Suddenly Pendlebury turned from the porter's grey eyes. You might want to mention it if you decide to see a doctor about the trouble yourself. The porter's voice was full of solicitude, but less full of hope. Nerves, to say it is. Just nerves. Well, that's it. That's the end of my Christmas compilation for 2023. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it lulled you off to sleep if that's what you wanted. I hope it uh, gave you some Christmas chills and uh, please keep listening to the podcast and if it is still before christmas merry christmas if you're hearing this between christmas and new year happy new year and um, i'll read you some more stories in 2024 good night <laughs>